Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're about to start the afternoon session of the um, MAG meeting. Open consultations is tomorrow, if you've just joined us after lunch. Uh, this is the first day of the MAG meeting. Okay. And with that, I'll give it to Lynn. Thank you, Changatai. Welcome back, everybody. So this afternoon's agenda has us spending another hour on um, some strategic topics at the MAG's choosing. And then um, from 4 to 4.30, we're going to have just a quick review of the IGF 2019 program themes. Um, what I would ask there is that um, somebody from the working groups that actually delivered or developed the narrative just maybe review quickly the narrative. If you have any insight into what's happening or any kind of update that you think would be important for the MAG, it was just to make sure that we didn't lose track of um, those themes in that, that part of the process. So we're not looking for a substantive update because, of course, the, the uh, workshop submission process is, is still open. Um, and then um, Yuta and I think a few other members from the team are going to walk us through a quick review of um, the evaluation tool, but also one or two um, open questions um, from the working group on the workshop eval process. And then, and I do hope we can keep both of those to the, the two half hour slots. Um, and then from five to six is when we're going to come back and revisit the strategic discussion, which will focus on the high level sessions and the day zero sessions. And I would ask everybody to really keep the terminology. Um, separate. We, we often say high-level sessions on day zero, and I think that confuses ourselves often, as well as others <laughs> external to the, to the room. So I think we can simply say high-level sessions, and then we will have a day zero um, discussion as well. Um, some sort of updates on the open and closing ceremonies, both in terms of ensuring we understand sort of the UN protocol that need to be followed at a high level, and any particular thoughts from the um, the German host country, and then um, maybe try and get some additional thoughts together on the on the main sessions. I think mean, it's a lot to go through in that hour, but if we can take it in that order and anything we don't get through, we can pick up in the next next couple of days. So um, just before lunch, we had um, started a discussion on sort of outputs and what more we might do in sort of two threads. One thread was, are there some sort of stylistic things and some support things and some mentoring things we can do that would actually um, support the workshops themselves. And then another one was, is there a way to um, uh, kind of advance some of the outputs coming out of the workshops in a way that was um, even more useful to the community at large? And we had just sort of started that discussion. We can continue with that if we'd like. And certainly, more concrete, tangible outputs has been a significant ask of many in the community um, and a significant part of many of the reviews that we've actually had. But if there's, this is also open, this is strategic time, if there are topics that some MAG members feel are, are more important than we discuss here, then we have some time to, to do that or at least initiate that topic and perhaps pick it up in the next couple of days. So I'll give everybody a moment to think. We either kind of reopen or stay with the output topic that was in front of us just before the lunch break, or move to another, another area. I'm not looking at anybody with intent. I'm literally just giving everybody a moment to sort of get their thoughts together and determine whether or not you want to, to take the floor. Well, then let me um, sort of jump in a little bit with respect to the outputs then. Um, I, I do think there are some things we can do that, again, are are more supportive of the workshop organizers, are more supportive of the facilitators that are there in the room. Um, I think we can take another look at the advice we give 
um, to workshop organizers and perhaps to the various reports we ask them to produce and the timing. Um, we either do that within um, a working group that already exists or perhaps set up another, another working group because I don't think that's something we would, we would take up here. We'd need to look through some fairly substantive documents and think through timetables and so I think it's more offline working group work than full mag work. But I would like to see um, you know, some effort put into are we doing everything we can to help with the processing in the room um, and that requires helping to process it um, you know, ahead of time as well. Again, the current reporting out process, and Eleonora can correct me if I'm wrong, basically has a, a whole template they need to fill out and they need to fill it out. Um, obviously there's a workshop submission process. As we get closer to the IGF itself, they start with um, kind of reasserting what their policy question is and their speakers and what they expect to, to get out of the session. And then um, a week before, well, do you want to take the floor, Eleanor? Are you okay doing that? I didn't, I didn't want to surprise you. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. Um, thank you, thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Um, I, uh, I'm actually racking my brain a little bit to remember the exact uh, process because there were a few steps. So uh, it was, in fact, a three-step reporting process um, where we asked the session organizers to submit a pre-report with some basic information uh, on the session and what they were giving us in advance that we didn't already have um, were some kind of succinct key messages um, uh, that uh, that uh, we could we could use um, to start putting together our own larger report of the meeting uh, and then a report after the session was held um, with of course more detail on the on the discussions uh, and then uh, if they chose to this was not mandatory a longer report a couple of weeks after the IGF itself um, uh, if they felt that uh, you know the word limit that we were asking for in the report immediately after the session uh, was too restrictive and they wanted to to give us more information about what happened in the session Thank you, Eleonora. Um, I'll come to you in a moment, Ben, and just to say that I think, I, I think we need to take this to a smaller group to actually look through the documents and the proposal and, and come back. Um, so let me go to, to Ben um, first and then process that. It was just to ask um, Eleonora and, and the Secretariat um, what proportion of uh, workshop organizers and open forum and all of the other sessions. Um, what proportion did you get back who actually provided the information you requested? How did how did it work out? Uh, thanks, Ben, for the question. Uh, we actually had a very good uh, compliance rate last year, especially considering that um, you know we were issuing some fairly complex instructions and um, the process was uh, you know put together a little bit last minute. Um, but in the end, we had an almost 100% uh, submission rate. Uh, I mean, of course, there were people who submitted past deadline, but um, with some chasing up in the end, I think almost everyone submitted a report. Paul, you have the floor. Thank you, Eleonora. Yeah, hi, Lynn. Uh, Paul Rowney. Um, yeah, so, sorry about this morning. It was a bit quiet. But I think I was about half an hour behind everything that was being discussed. So I think I've caught up over lunchtime. Uh, d one thing we were discussing over lunch, which I think is quite uh, interesting as a thought-provoking thing, is uh, the main sessions. And last year, the main sessions took place throughout the whole IGF from the beginning to the end. And the question is really, you know, should the main sessions be at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, or does it matter? If they're towards the end of the IGF, then they can be used to sort of bring together what was discussed in the different workshops that are part of that theme and sort of bring a wrap-up or a thought of how we can structure what was discussed. So rather than having them, like last year, all over the place or throughout, which distracts people from the actual workshops, is to try and draw them to the end, particularly the th around the three thematic areas that we have. Thank you. No, I, th I think that's an interesting, interesting suggestion, and 
um, maybe when we come to that, we can actually think about what is it we want to kind of achieve with this three thematic process, and then how are we best support that? Um, I think that was a really interesting suggestion. I'm, I'm kind of loath to suggest what I'm going to suggest in a moment, just because the secretariat is so sort of over resource. But um, it, it would be a normal secretariat function to look at coming back to the all the prep materials and the the sort of organizational materials and reporting. It would be a normal secretariat function to look at the set of materials that we actually give to the workshop organizers in terms of advice and reporting, um, understanding what you're looking for in terms of the reporting at the, at the end, and perhaps um, look at whether or not there are any areas for improvement on the basis of the discussions we've had here and, and we'll have tomorrow, particularly with the community, and maybe put those back out to the, to the MAG for review. Um, I think it's an awful lot, and frankly, too much for people to take in sitting here now to understand that process and think about what some some improvements might be. But I'm confident that the Secretariat understands what we're trying to do in terms of um, both facilitating kind of the um, the the level and the positioning and the the conciseness, if you will, even of the the messages that come out of the out of the workshops. And I'm certainly happy to be a part of that review, and maybe there'll be some other. Um, MAG members as well, which would be. But if we could do that and um, look to that in the next sort of month or so, would probably be about the right, the right time frame. Is that okay, Jenny and Eleanor? We have the documents already, which were produced um, most recently by the by the Secretariat. So then I, I think if we if we leave the, the the kind of more operational aspects of um, the reports. Um, to the Secretariat for the next step in the process. Um, is there a discussion um, the MAG wants to engage in with respect to what we can do to um, step up the, the level, the usefulness of the outputs that come out of the individual sessions? Um, in particular, there have been, a, a, again, a, a couple of things that have been mooted through various working groups. One is to maybe look at some of the processes in the NRIs to see if there's some learnings there that we can pull into the, to the IGF. I don't know if Jeremy Malcolm is on the call remotely or not, um, but he is um, one of the individuals who wrote the proposal, which is looking at other methodologies um, to advance recommendations within the within the IGF. Does everybody think we're doing everything we can with respect to the outputs as they sort of exit the workshop sessions and as they, Carlos and Hartmut, can I, sorry, it's actually quite loud. <laughs> um, do we think there's more we might be doing to actually, um, as the outputs exit those workshop sessions, to make them more useful? We certainly have a lot of work to do with respect to capturing and, um, you know, perhaps consolidating and marketing and directing. And but, I mean, are we happy with the level of outputs that come out of the, the various workshop sessions now? And I'm not suggesting that unhappiness is a negative thing. It's, I mean, we're, everything we're doing in this space is about continual improvement. So are there improvements that we can see that would actually help kick the outputs up to another level? Yuta, you have the floor. Thank, <coughs> thank you, Lynn. I, I do think what Ben Wallace said before about uh, when we should have the main session. Oh, no, it was Paul, Paul Roney. So, sorry. Uh, uh, about when we should have the main sessions in the program is somehow a way forward to this because the outcomes from the sessions could somehow feed into into the main sessions if we decide to have main sessions grouped around the three main themes of, of the IGF. So and all the workshops will somehow be allocated to the three main themes uh, and then it's a question, what can we take out? What is an outcome that can be taken forward to a main session?
Thank you, Utah. Sorry, I was both reading and shaking my head, but thank you. Well, one option is we pivot to a main session discussion now since it's on our agenda later today. Um, another option is we come back and we look at some of the other strategic um, issues that were in the list that were in the agenda um, and determine if there's something else the MAG would actually like to talk about now. So that list had um, some of the areas that had been mentioned as areas for um, uh, possible future strategic priorities were to identify um, and ensure that we were focusing appropriately on emerging issues or the most consequential questions, um, strengthening outputs and recommendations, which we're talking about, uh, the relationship or increasing engagement with the national, regional, regional and youth IGF initiatives, which I think are really strategic area. Um, I'm not sure that's best done here because we would want to make sure we had appropriate representation from the NRIs, of course, to, to do that discussion so that we were having the discussion with them. Um, anything else we can do to strengthen other intercessional activities? We have increasing participation from senior policymakers in the private sector, increasing stakeholder engagement or inclusion, improving outreach and support, working towards a cohesive program and a cohesive overall program structure. I think we've discussed the multi-year strategic program and fundraising was on there as well. Susan, you have the floor. Thanks, Chair. Um, just uh, just some thoughts on the, the question of outputs that, um, and I agree it might be useful to have a, a smaller group uh, if we want to toss around ideas about the format of the outputs, um, et cetera. But I think one question that might be useful to ask first is, what do we want for these outputs to achieve? Um, what are the different impacts that we want these outputs to have? I think once we're able to ask that, answer these types of questions, that will assist us in um, writing for a certain audience or, or um, producing in a particular format. Um, so I would, I would encourage folks to kind of maybe consider that first. It, it could be helpful in moving the discussion along. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. I think that's an interesting, interesting suggestion. So anybody who wants to follow up on that approach? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'll revert to using my speaking cue. Apologies. Um, I think just to add on to what Susan said about like what exa exactly you're trying to achieve in terms of that would help us in our outputs. I think one thing I had suggested in the earlier initial meeting at the beginning of the year, of the year was to actually ask our community what it is they would like to get out of um, IGF because we often ask them what it is they want to hear at the sessions, what it is they want to know about, and um, I know in my line of work we call it like an audience analysis, but in essence we would be better able to package outputs based on knowing what it is exactly the community wants to know. Because maybe the reports are quite lengthy, but they probably want to get like figures or images, a particular grouping, and maybe policymakers want the big longer reports. So we'll be able to actually package things as according to what the different constituencies say they need. So it strikes me that we actually have multiple stakeholders here in the room. We have government representatives, we have private sector representatives, civil society and technical community. Yeah. Um, maybe rather than us trying to figure out what some third party wants, we ask people to, from the, purpose, from the position of their stakeholder view as a government, it would be helpful to me if X, as a private sector leader, it would be helpful to me if X. Um, I mean, is there anybody who wants to jump into that? Daniela? Thanks. I just wanted um, to react a little bit to what uh, Paul and, and Jutta said. I think um, discussing the structure of the program also in, in the sense of what kind of sessions when 
uh, is certainly a way forward. And then maybe also comment to, to Susan. Um, yes, it's very important to ask first what we want to do with the outputs or what the stakeholders want to do with the outputs when thinking about what kind of outputs. Uh, but, but then I would refer to the Tunis agenda because, I mean, what's, what's our task? Our task is identify emerging issues, bring them to the attention of the relevant bodies and the general public, and where appropriate, make recommendations. And that, in my view, means that we should ask ourselves what kind of outputs do we need to address the broader public in, in an understandable way and wh how can we transfer our discussions to the decision makers because they cannot follow the whole IGF so in a sense that's also what I uh, picked up before the question of there are outputs but do we um, bind them together in a strategic way to inform either people who are not inside our community or not yet inside our community and on the other and uh, the high-ranking people that do not have the time to, to read 50 pages, but just want to have the main messages. And, and maybe that's also our task, and we should ask ourselves if we are really doing the right job up to now to get that kind of strategic output. And, and I think that should be our aim. Thanks. Thank you, Daniela. Sometimes talking about it in the abstract could be difficult. If we said, choose one of the main themes that we have, um, data governance or inclusion or access within inclusion, um, would it be worthwhile to, to maybe take those three themes and think about who we're trying to address by the work we're actually and, and of course, we don't have the workshops in front of us yet, but we had these narratives for these three themes. And the narrative said, we think this is um, something to be considered, and we're looking for workshop proposals that actually address those particular narratives. Um, I'm still trying to follow up on Susan's, Susan's suggestion, right? I've been trying to drive it down to something concrete. If we take, just as an example, one of those themes, does that help us figure out if we were to start to say, who are we trying to address with this theme? What are the particular issues? How would we approach it? That would actually give us a communications plan at the end as well, which would say, these are who we think are the targets of these particular um, workshops or these particular outputs. And, and this isn't work I expect us to do in the, the full mag here, but if we can figure out what the process is and what the work is that we think we want done, then we can get some ad hoc you know, groups to go away and and do that. And again, partly I'm talking to stall <laughs> and buy you all time to jump in here. So um, when somebody has a better idea or, or something that you think would actually work, please jump in. I see Susan's request of the floor again. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you, Chair. And just as uh, a follow-up, so I, I think that um, directing, you know, having decision makers whether they be um, government or decision makers in the private sector, or decision makers in general, I think there are a multitude of um, as there are a multitude of different audiences. We have a multitude of different stakeholder groups here as well. For example, I, I, I would um, encourage us to think about targeting all levels um, and different strata of the community. Um, for example. Um, We've been discussing within the dynamic coalition on DNS issues how to engage um, folks who are going to appeal to or de um, appeal to decision makers about universal acceptance readiness. So it's it's guidance um, not only for people who make the decisions, but for people who want to be able to engage the decision makers and how to do that effectively. So I, I guess I would just encourage us to. Um, to have a and keep a broad spectrum of decision makers or audience members in mind, but I also appreciate your brainstorming on the the themes, and I just have to think about it a wee bit. Maybe the decision makers or the targeted audiences become more clear the more specific we get on what the particular issue is we're so, we're 
addressing or the particular policy question we're trying to um, advance. Miguel, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, keeping the flow of what we are talking, um, maybe um, and taking into account that uh, we need to you know, understand the, res the nature of our own outputs. The, um, I wanted to, to make sure that we understand that um, the outputs are there, we know, we've seen it, we, we, we are talking about them year after year. I, I believe that uh, what we can be okay with it, not satisfied with it, we can always do better. But uh, it's, even, it's more of about the impact of the outputs. You know, uh, and, and here I have to say two things. One, if we are going with the text of the Tunis Agenda and talk about recommendations, we need to remember that we are in, a, in an UN setting and a recommendation, if we are looking at it from the eyes of a government, it has a, a certain amount of responsibility towards every single government and uh, we, we might find some resistance from different stakeholders, but particularly governments that don't understand maybe the idea of the recommendations we are trying to put out. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it's, good to, it's good to find maybe a moment within the program to not make a, uh, an, an extract or anything, but to talk about uh, the workshops, uh, you know, someone high level uh, to, to speak about uh, to all the audience of the uh, Global AGF about the end game, what we want about the, with the workshop, why, why we are having workshops. Uh, it's, it shouldn't take too long, maybe uh, 15 minutes or uh, in, in some part of the program, but to, to make people understand why we are having these um, sessions within the agenda that might seem to, you know, disgress everything. You know, we are talking about too many things at the same time. Uh, that, that was a uh, criticism we faced uh, in the years before. Maybe if we can give an idea at a, high, uh, at a political level that why we are doing this in, in order to advance, in order to move forward, in order to understand better the problematics, but uh, the end game. And, and maybe that can uh, create some expectations uh, in the communities that we can use as a, as a force within, uh, within IGFs, you know, between IGFs, sorry you know, around the year that we can, uh, ac alongside with the, with the uh, regional and national IGFs, uh, to keep that uh, as, a, as a momentum, as a force that, uh, that will bring us to, you know, an end of the work that year with the, with the workshops, so we understand that um, what, what the, the main issues are, that uh, they were seen in the workshops, how the discussions went, and some sort of an output about this uh, whole process. Maybe that could help in order to, you know, make people know, uh, particularly with the workshops, uh, what what the outputs are, because there are too many. Maybe giving them an idea. Thank you. Sorry for taking so long. No, no, I think that's a good idea, uh, Miguel. Um, let me go to Nabosha. Uh, hi, uh, Nebois Rege, uh, government, uh, second term in the MAG. Uh, one question for the Secretariat. Do we distribute the um, conclusions uh, or recommendations through the UN system to the member countries in some way, or we just uh, uh, publicly, uh, you know, put them on the web page or not? If we are not doing that, uh, I think it might be very useful if we have uh, a document of uh, two pages uh, distributed uh, uh, either through the uh, UN in New York or here in uh, Geneva uh, to the missions of the member countries uh, with a brief report uh, that uh, what what were the outcomes, recommendations, or suggestions from the IGF? Thank you. No, uh, yes, uh, that's a good idea. We, in our communication um, 
plan that we've been talking between um, us, the IGF Secretary, and UNDESA. Uh, that is one of our plans, first of all, to distribute it amongst the missions in New York and here, and also distribute it, you know, to other UN agencies, you know, like UNESCO, et cetera. And then, apart from that, distribute it to um, allied agencies like the OECD, and the Council of Europe, uh, sorry, not the Council of Europe, we haven't thought about the Council of Europe, but um, the European Commission, because, you know, they have similar programs and they are, you know, supporters of the IGF, so if they could distribute it as well. So that is in the plan for this year. So can I try a different exercise? <laughs> can I try and personalize it a little bit, but not ask anybody to raise hands or show of hands? Um, I want everybody to just ask themselves, how many of you read the chair's summary? Again, I'm not looking for a show of hands, but I mean just, how many of you um, went looking for workshops on a particular topic and either found the, and again, I, I don't need a show of hands, I'm not trying to, you know, call anybody out, I'm just really trying to get us to drill down and figure out where they're useful and where they're not. So how many people have gone looking for workshops on a particular topic and read through the workshops or found the workshop reports? How many people passed any of those workshops? How many people said, ah, this would be really useful to X and passed it on? How many people passed on the chair summary saying this would be useful? So no, I mean, I know, I know some of you did, but I'm saying, you know, we all, and look, we're all giving a lot of time for something that we obviously care a lot about and feel very strongly makes a difference in, in the world. And I think we need to get that beyond the 2,000, 3,000 people that are really kind of intimately into all this internet governance because, uh, you know, they're not the only ones we're trying to engage with or, or we're trying to, um, you know, to all of, us, all of us move forward. It goes far beyond that. So, I mean, I, again, I'm just trying to find ways to unlock, you know, what are our log jams? Are, are our log jams... The reports, the outputs aren't particularly accessible or they're not particularly useful or they're too hard to find on the website. Um, are they not concrete enough or specific enough? Is the advice too general and therefore it's not really of a lot of use to policymakers? And if I give this to somebody, another entity, it's going to be something they read the other day in the Financial Times or, I mean, I, I don't we all hear every single day that, you know, the output could be better out of the IGF. And sometimes they mean, wish I could find them more easily. I wish they were more accessible. I wish they were more targeted. I wish they were more concrete. I wish all these things. But how do we try and distill all those conversations down to say, here's two or three things we can go away and begin addressing that are going to give us a better set of outputs so that the world is actually going to say, this is helpful, this is useful, and I want more. <coughs> Jennifer, are you on the floor? Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Um, Jennifer Chung, since I'm taking the floor for the first time this meeting, and I'm just going to say MAG member, the second year MAG member, private sector. Um, before you made your um, summary just now, Chair, I was actually looking through the IGF website to look at the kind of information, the kind of reports, the kind of wealth of outputs that we have from last year and the years before and was wondering you know how easy would it be for me to find these things to pass it on how comprehensive is it and I after a little bit of digging and maybe it's my lack of you know knowledge of the website so much I did find you know the list of um, workshops last year all the reports that were given and I think we do have a wealth of knowledge there a wealth of outputs that we can right now think about how better to package. I think Susan mentioned a little earlier a really good starting point for us. What do we hope to get? What do we hope to get for for these outputs? Who are we hoping that will see these outputs? Who are we hoping that will take action on these outputs? Even if it's not something that you want someone to take action on, how are we packaging it? Um, Susan made a um, a reference to the DC DNSI issues. What they were thinking about, you know messaging that needs to go to different strata of the people that you're talking to. You know, for example, if you're 
asking UN agencies or governments to look at reports, they're not going to look at a 50-page report. They're going to look at a two-page summary. And the way the two-page summary report is packaged in a way to appeal to people reading it. If you're looking to try to engage more private sector, you know, we're more interested in looking at figures. We're interested in looking at how this actually can um, impact the, the particular sector we're, we're working in. If you're looking at civil society, maybe they're looking at you know a, a package where they can spark discussion, conversation within their own communities and vice versa and bring that back. So I think we do have a lot of output and we perhaps need to strate strategically think about how we can package that to speak to the different audiences we want to impact and we want to bring into the IGF ecosystem. And it's not just people who are already engaged. Of course, we need to continue engaging them for them to realize, you know, engaging with the IGF is impactful and is useful, but we also need to see how we can attract these new audiences. And maybe it's a marketing exercise, maybe it's a communications exercise, but I think this is something we should think about. Thank you, Jennifer. Some really interesting things to think about there as well. So I'm, I mean, I've been doing a little bit of looking about in terms of other similar processes to see what they're doing. And one interesting one is the UN Global Compact. Um, if you actually look at them. And there's, you know, a fair amount of similarities between what they're doing and um, what they're, in terms of kind of approach and, and intent. Um, I don't know if there's some things we can learn from looking at some of these other activities. I don't know if we can lean on some of these other entities within the UN. We need to make it, find a, need to find a way to make it a win-win for both organizations. Um, but again, whether or not we can get some guidance or leadership in terms of how we should process ourselves through this. I mean, this is obviously um, a real set of expertise as well. Um, we could, in fact, take a subset and, and maybe try and think through one or two processes if we started with one of the themes or and maybe one of the tags underneath the theme and said, again, who are we trying to reach, to what purpose, and how can we best do that? Um, I think we could do more around campaigns as well, which we could get through the community with the support of the community that would get interest. And that's a little bit of what you see if you go to the UN Global Compact. Um, you know, this sustainability, 10 principles were sustainable, something. I think I'm sure I'm confusing multiple sites there with what I just said, no. but, but you know, they, they do that by getting, you know, campaigns and initiatives and something that builds excitement and gets people to, to think about and come to the issues. Um, maybe that's, you know, marketing in quotes or something that we could do in terms of building interest in, and um, outreach at the same time. Um, again, just trying to spark <laughs> different pointers here. Um, Paul Rowney. Paul, you have the floor. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Paul Rowney. Just commenting to some of what's been discussed. Uh, firstly, I don't find the uh, IGF website very friendly. Uh, I find it quite difficult to find information, and it, it's quite laborious actually to, to work through it to get to where you want to get to. So that, that, that's just a personal comment. I don't know if everyone has the same experience. Uh, I, I, I think if people are expected to go and find information, uh, it's not that easy to find. Uh, it's not intuitive to find the information. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, marketing and I think it is uh, uh, key that we do look at how we market the outcomes and uh, the reports and, and make sure that uh, the stakeholders are aware or, or, or it's pushed out to them, for example. Uh, but basically make it easier for the stakeholders to know how to get it or to make sure it gets to them. and. The, just looking at the A4 AI on their affordability report, I think that's their key output, and I think they do quite well marketing and getting that out. And maybe a similar type of approach uh, could could be useful. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. 
Hannah, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks to those who have spoken before. Um, just, just to pick up and and and, and broaden the brainstorming here, uh, definitely support uh, the wider dissemination of the chair's summary. Um, with thanks to chairs for for putting that together. Uh, but also, I think I think one of the benefits of the chair's summary is that it's it's a digestible um, account of what's of all the discussions happening at the IGF. Um, I wonder whether it would be possible to look at, at uh, aggregating some of the summaries of the different workshops. So if there's multiple workshops on similar topics, instead of having five different files for five different workshops, is there some way to get key messages um, across themes instead of, uh, so, so somewhere in between the, the level of a chair summary and um, the, the more granular individual workshops things, which would, be key messages that are largely agreeable uh, to the participants, but that might also uh, be a stepping stone towards recommendations or, or something that's useful. Um, I think building on the, the Global Compact idea, uh, the Global Compact, of course, has principles that you sign on to. So is there something um, across some of the themes that, that might be taken up by a community or a series of different actors. Uh, I don't really know. As you've, as you've mentioned, it's hard to speak uh, without looking at specifics. Um, but I think it's, it's worth thinking about. Um, it's also worth thinking about when we're, when we're putting together the program or looking at proposals. Um, I think this happens in every UN setting. There'll be a lot of different actors that, that plan on having similar events but don't necessarily partner on them or don't really know uh, who has an interest in a similar event? Um, so maybe in terms of front loading the work, if we can if we see that there's several different actors that are already going to do something on, say security, um, instead of just saying that they have to do separate reports, maybe we can encourage um, that they speak together mm -hmm. about how to diversify the different conversations um, and also how to have some some a common outcome output. The difficulty uh, I want to flag with, with talking about outcomes and outputs is even if we're, we're thinking of the examples in the room, everyone has a different definition of what that is. Um, for some it's a declaration, for some it's a report, and those are very different things. Um, so I think a variety is, is good, uh, but, but for us to figure out where we can add value, we'd need probably a common, a common definition of some kind. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. I'll just keep jumping in. Maybe, maybe, and this this is all just in, in brainstorming. I mean, trying to get different thoughts coming from all corners of the room, and of course, the mag will have to go away and think about what might work or not. But when we created the three themes, and we had the, the, the working groups, or I don't think we called them working groups, so we wouldn't confuse them, but the, the ad hoc groups go away and develop the narratives. Um, and, you know, one might imagine that process extending throughout the program setting process. So you support the narratives, you support the call. Um, once the MAG has gone through the workshop approval process, maybe there's another um, process that comes in sideways or at the same time that actually looks for, um, you know, are we really pulling in the topics that are really pertinent and, and clear within this topic? Can we do some of the the threading that I think Hanna was sort of alluding to, and, and maybe that culminates in um, a, a synthesized report at the end or an out report or something. So maybe there's an opportunity to keep those kind of narrative groups together to help with some um, further shaping through the, again, I, I know there are going to be pros and cons to that in people's minds here. I'm really just trying to throw, throw various ideas out. The other thing that sort of strikes me when I look through the, the list is um, the, um, the IGF website, and by the way, Lewis does a superb job managing the website and all of the IT support and all of the audiovisual and all the remote participation support and absolutely everything. So, I mean, we should say that right, right up front. Um, but maybe there's a different approach to the website, which the website that we have today sort of says this is what's happening at the moment in the process. That's pretty much what it does. This meeting was held. This meeting's coming up. Here's where you find the report. Here's the. So you look at it. You don't immediately get excited about internet, or internet governance, or inclusion, or anything, because it's kind of the process. The next meeting. Here's the deadline for 
and maybe those go on subsidiary pages and we start with you know the IGF you know I don't know 2019 cares about inclusion cares about data governance cares about and we lead with some pictures and the narratives and that's what the IGF 2019 is about and we create a storyboard or something up up front um, but that's not website work that's mag work or our community work here um, and I think that should be something which is kind of quite easy to do doesn't take away from anything that's there all that information is absolutely necessary and it's still there but we find a, a higher level kind of more exciting more pulling your heartstrings or something a little bit to pull you into the to the work so again just in the nature of just throwing lots of things out there I'll, I'll go back to the queue now Paul Paul Charlton you have the floor Oh, thank you, it's, uh, thank you, Chair. It's Paul, Paul Charlton. Um, I was just going to um, follow up on, on what you were saying and also what Paul Rowney was saying about the website. I, I agree. I think the way the way in which we we present information there now it's it's kind of it's kind of static and, and focused on process, which of course is necessary in terms of building each year's uh, IGF because there's so much work to do. Um, but the past IGFs are they're sort of treated like they're they're sort of back there in the archives. Uh, and when I think of how um, uh, sort of large UN agencies, for example, um, uh, but I, th I suppose it, it goes with other large organizations as well, present themselves on the web. It's, you know, there's, there's a focus of, we just did this and we're doing this. This is what we stand for. Sort of like some of the points you were, you were um, making. And I agree that's not just a matter of website management. It's a matter of, of, of uh, MAG and uh, the MAG and other stakeholders uh, working on working on those types types of, of messages for for presentation. It strikes me as well that we we also have a, a structural problem it, because it's just the nature of the IGF that we don't have uh, one person who is sort of elected as uh, a secretary general or a director general. Again, comparing us to a UN agency, where that person's full time job would be. Uh, not just management, but also promotion and and uh, uh, and promoting the organization uh, and its mandate and its messages. So that's something we just have to to um, uh, to struggle against. Um, uh, but I think this is this is you know this type of work is is well worth doing. And it, it seems to me that there's you know there's a connection between this whole issue of how we're presenting ourselves and also the the concept of what sort of messages are we going to, to put out every year? Um, perhaps there's a little bit of complexity as well because it seems to me when we talk about outputs or results, it, it's almost at two levels. One, there are the specific reports of specific meetings or events or workshops uh, or sessions. And then there are these higher level, more sort of strategic messages. Maybe the strategic messages are, are more difficult. And in that sense, I would agree with Susan and Jennifer that we, Although we ha we have what's written in the Tunis agenda in terms of our mandate, but I think we do have to think of the intended audience and also think of because there are so many um, different uh, entities and venues that are discussing these issues. What is our value added? And I I mean our value added I think in some terms is the the nature that we are truly multi stakeholder, uh, where many other venues are not, and also that we we're looking at. Um, a fairly significant range of issues. I know we're trying to narrow it down and 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 maybe focus on a more limited group. But those I see as the the two things that are value added, and I think it's a a, a matter of how do we how do we capitalize on that and, and use that as a basis for developing these messages and these outputs. I'm sorry, I don't I don't have any answers, but those are just some reflections. I th I think they're very helpful reflections and appreciate your coming in. Um, we'll go through the queue and then why don't we um, close this. We'll come back to it over the next couple of days and so we can go to the rest of the agenda. But we will go through the queue that's up there um, at the moment. So TD, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn, for giving me the floor. I um, want to just share some thought about uh, uh, what I think should be improved because uh, uh, just looking at the uh, paragraph 72G of uh, Tunis's agenda, it says that uh, we have to identify emerging issues. And we have started a good process this year because we have uh, just identified uh, three 
thematic area and we are going to actually discuss, identify uh, what are the suggestions that will come from the global uh, event. But I think that we should bring uh, uh, more attention on the, on the second pa part of, the, uh, of the, this um, sentence that says, uh, bring them to the attention of relevant bodies. I mean, what uh, IGF does to bring the attention of the results of the IGF to the relevant bodies? And which are the relevant bodies? Because, uh, for instance, uh, if you, you want to have an impact in Italy, we have different bodies which are involved in Internet governance. There are authorities related to privacy, authorities related to, for instance, uh, um, communication and so on. So I think that we should focus on these centers and try to do more, I mean, to bring the attention. And also about make recommendation. I mean, which kind of recommendation makes it IGF? We usually um, issue some reports we don't uh, publish um, very strong recommendation, and we don't send them to the public authorities and so on. I think this is uh, the, the part that is missing. And when I, 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 I was thinking about governments, but it's not only governments, it's also uh, business and so on, because recommendation should be, uh, I mean, uh, communicating in a broader way, I think, respect to, to now, because uh, the website is not enough, because people, usually have um, many other things to do, so you need to catch their attention, I mean, to have impact and to improve in some, uh, in some topics. Okay, that's it. Thank you. I think they were very good, good points as well, T. We have a few more people in the, in the queue. Dennis wanted to say a few words as well. Is that now or a bit later? No. No, uh, about, about the website, I think I cannot agree more with everyone. Uh, all the comments are valid. But uh, for me also, it took some time uh, to use this IGF website. And it is a portal within portals. So we have uh, the uh, 2018 IGF as a separate portal. Uh, and, and you need to go there and you need to study a bit. And maybe we should do uh, more maybe capacity building on that. And also, let's not forget the host country website. And it's it's up there, and 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 it's much more interesting. You can see why you should involve with IGF. You see uh, different interviews. So I find it uh, very helpful. Uh, and one one point about the uh, suggestion uh, that uh, Hanna made about the uh, key messages. Uh, categorized by teams. Uh, that's actually what we did uh, at the end of the, during the IGF 2018. So if you go to the archive at the bottom of the website and click on uh, IGF 2018, then you would see the chair summary and uh, key messages there. And we have two pages, I think, for each uh, thematic issue. If I can just say, your last comment just kind of proved the point that's been made in the room. If you go to the archive and you go to the bottom of the page and you click on the X and you go here and you go there, you get to the chair summary. If the chair summary was the result of everything we did last year through the IGF and the IGF ecosystem, if you went to any other website, you'd see a little book cover up in the corner um, with it there. You'd see the other books as well. And so I think, I think it's just the, the points that we can, can um, do more. Sorry for getting overexcited there. Um, <laughs> Um, Mamadou. Oh, okay, Eleanor. Sorry, uh, thank you for, for giving me the floor. I just wanted to, to tack on to what Dennis said because I think in this discussion, the fact that we produced the messages got lost and of course that's also connected to how accessible things are on our website and I just wanted to, to quickly add so the, the process is more clear for everyone that the messages are connected to the session reporting, that the reports that came out of the sessions were then used as the basis for these key messages. So yeah, it's important for that to be understood particularly to encourage everybody to do, <laughs> to do great work again this year. And thank you, Eleonora. Mamadou, Mamadou, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Mamadou Lowe from Senegal, private sector stakeholder. Uh, I would like to echo some of my colleagues calling for more marketing to showcase and distribute well our works and outputs. One example is what has been done during ICON 64 with outreach and capacity development session organized by the IGF Secretariat. It will be nice if we can replicate this, this during most of IG events with IGF boots 
and document, mat and document materials like IGF annual report, IGF workshop reports, main session reports, leaflet and brochure. As we need places and moments to share and talk on them with the general public. I'm also thinking on how we can use TV broadcasts to showcase IGF annual event. Also, I, am, I was thinking about how we can evaluate the workshop effectively done on seat. I asked the question in our first MAG meeting, and I'm waiting for a, re a response from the working group on, ev on workshop evaluation. Thank you very much. Say, um, Mamadou led the working group on communications and outreach last year, and I think we'll continue to be engaged this year, but has indicated that um, he's not able to lead it. I think we do have a new leader for it. Was it our scene? Yes, I thought so. Thank you. Um, Miguel, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. It's Miguel Candia for the record. Um, sorry, to take, sorry to take the floor again on the same issue. But um, uh, some of the points that I was going to make are already, uh, they, they were already taken uh, upon. But uh, just to say that, uh, you know, various formats and tracks have various outputs. That's one of our problems. <laughs> but it is as well one of our strengths. We have a lot of things that come out of the IGF. Uh, it, it, we need to make sense of it. But uh, it, it, I, I'm going to insist on the point that uh, it is the impact that we need. Um, and our impact, I, th I think, our, the shorter leg we have is uh, to get known. Uh, we are maybe less known than the ITU in these matters, uh, possibly uh, less than UNCTAD, uh, in the diplomatic community at least. Uh, but uh, I think we're getting uh, bigger and bigger within the, the, the broader view of the communities. So that, if, if that is a, a, a way we need to, to continue going on. And um, um, this impact and this getting known with will in at the same time get people excited about looking into internet governance that may or may not just have us the IGF as a source you can go to any single institution who uh, speaks about these issues uh, maybe ISOC as, as well uh, but uh, it's uh, that's f completely fair but we we are in a uh, we are in an environment with a lot of opportunities for the uh, for the people in uh, looking at their computers so we need to you know get better uh, get more visible and uh, i usually sell in quotes the the igf back home as the only naturally multi stakeholder uh, fora forum within the un system uh, particularly for if we're if I'm talking with other government officials, and um, that's why when we talk about this, uh, we see the IGF as a as a place where we can speak uh, more freely, instead of being constrained by our instructions. For example, when we go into meetings, we know what to say and what not to say, and w that's one of the strengths of the IGF that we may put everywhere for people to see you can speak freely here so that's one one suggestion of course we need to give it a better form <laughs> for for the public but uh, i think what that is one of our strengths as well you can speak freely here about this, the issues that interest you and um, just a very short thing about the about the website uh well, we have to understand that uh, the website is doing what what we are asking the website to do so it's been evolving it's been changing it's been growing and, and of course, we have the host website, but the, the only thing with uh, the other problem with that is that it's temporary. It's only one year. And then we have to move to another host web website. So we are indeed in, in need of uh, a small evolution with a, we, within a very good website that we have with a lot of information. To, uh, so much information that is becoming hard to find it. But uh, we, we, we may have the we need to have this you know forefront that is very easy to to get people into and then when you go deeper you go deeper but uh, you go because you want to 
of the, I, I don't know, the first two clicks should give you uh, very interesting, exciting information. And that's, I think, uh, something that the, the Secretariat can manage. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking so long. No, th thank you, Miguel. I'm going to turn to Danielle in a moment and give her um, the floor, and then I'm going to come back and just propose something f with respect to what we would bring forward to tomorrow's discussion. But I want, to, I want to say this again. I want to underline, I don't know that I've ever entered into a website discussion where I've heard, it's perfect, don't change a thing. <laughs> you know, it, it is, things change fast. I mean, messages in the world change fast. The tools change fast. What is an appropriate style changes fast. So every, every time I've entered these discussions, it's we could do more, we could do this, we could do that. It's in that vein that I think we're having the conversation. So again, I want to make sure that um, nobody here, that so the Secretary Lewis are, are taking any um, kind of negative impressions away from the discussion. Um, this is really, I think it's more existential than it is actually web focus, which is, you know, what are we? What do we want to represent to the world and how do we want to tell them about it? And I think that's basically the conversation we're having. If we had that, we could, we could put that into the website. So I just want to underline that again. I'm always overly sensitive to that, particularly with a very small resource that's very much overworked. And certainly hope they all feel really very appreciated. But Danielle, you have some, some words and then we'll, we'll wrap the session up. Thank you, Lynn. Maybe not for wrapping up. <laughs> <laughs> no, th thanks to Dennis um, for say, uh, saying such nice words about our website. Uh, um, but in fact, I mean, that's in our view sort of an add-on. And of course, we try to do our homework in the sense of uh, public relations for the IGF 2019. But this is in no way a website that could replace or be in, in, in let's say, really, I mean, output giving place for um, for the Internet Governance Forum. I mean, th the basic output should be on the IGF homepage itself. Of course, we will try to give, give an add-on, um, but this is an extra way of doing things. And um, I, this is not bashing on, on websites, but uh, as a newcomer, I also had the impression that it's not very easy to find the most important things in the in, in the first <coughs> 30 seconds, right? So, so maybe there, there, there is a task also to do to uh, get information more easily to users or to people who just have heard about the IGF and then go to the website and, and then try to find out what it's all about and what are the, the key messages of the IGF. Um, Having said that, and, and maybe then trying to, to take a takeaway from what we have discussed today, um, maybe we should, when we look uh, what has been submitted as workshops and, and open fora, et cetera, in main sessions, then have a discussion in June about how to structure the program in the way that at the end we can maybe grab things out of the whole discussions that are sort of key messages and then could be put on a two-pager, for example, and have that uh, at the front web page of the Internet Governance Forum. Maybe that's also kind of an output uh, that would be easy to di digest. And then I think uh, it's a task for all of us to then distribute that and uh, send links, as you mentioned before, uh, um, to the, the broader public and giving them more, let's say, knowledge about what we are doing here and uh, giving them easier access uh, to the outcomes. Thanks. No, thank, thank you, Daniela. Um, I, I, this is actually when we should move to the rest of the agenda. What I was going to propose, and I'll, I'll come back to the Q and see who wants to come in on this again in a moment, but what I was going to propose is that um, Maybe I work with uh, Eleanor and Chengatai and the Secretariat to get a couple of paragraphs together that capture the discussion this morning before lunch and this afternoon, which says, you know, the MAG discussed X, two, three, year multi, and what that is. The MAG had a discussion on outputs um, and try and kind of just a, a short paragraph or two that we can use as introduction to the discussion with the community tomorrow so that they understand what we were trying to talk about um, but that we actually ask them for their ideas. Um, and if they have lots of um, ideas, then that's fantastic. 
Um, we can certainly bounce some of the things we've kicked around here um, off them as well. But that would be the way I would propose we actually kind of drive through the strategic part of the discussion tomorrow as part of the open community. Does that seem seem good? Seem okay? Um, so again, with that, normally we would be coming to the review of the 2019 program themes. I'm not sure if the people that are in the queue are anticipating that and are there for that discussion, or were you in the queue for the discussion where we're just trying to conclude here. <laughs> so let me go through quickly and see. Um, if it's opening up a new front, um, maybe you could either send a note to the mag list or say it for the discussion tomorrow, because I think it's important that we actually go through um, these other remaining, uh, remaining sessions today as well, ahead of the community consultation uh, tomorrow. So Paul, you have the floor. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very quick, just not to repeat what's been said, but I just want to reiterate that uh, the IGF is the brand and that uh, the website is not an IT issue, it's a marketing issue. So we shouldn't look at it from a technology perspective, we should look at it from a brand and marketing perspective. So we shouldn't be looking to Lewis to create that brand, it's not an IT issue. <laughs> And what we have right now is an internet on the web, basically. And we don't really have a website presence. That was well said, particularly your first, first comment. Um, Mamadou, Mamadou, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. I would like to stress again on the, on the website issue, the website issue. I think the issue we are facing right now is an is a issue relating to a communication channel. I think we have to diversify our communication channels. So website is just one among them. And I think our, we, we have targets. But the targets are not using the website. The, the, the website. In Africa, for example, in the Arab region, perhaps they use other targets to, 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 to you know, as a communication channel to know how these are there, but we are, what, what we are doing right now. I just for that, I think that we need to diversify our communication channel to reach uh, more on the, in, in, uh, on the IGF landscape. Thanks you. Thank you, Mamadou. Carlos. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, well, I disagree with Paul on the portal being a marketing issue. I think is much more than that, and it could be much more than that. A reference for for researchers, uh, a content repository, and so on. So we this is not a technological point of view; this is a knowledge point of view, and it's important that we have ways to make them more effective the the disposition of content available in the portal. Another thing that uh, I would like to, to to float here is what if we found, and we, generic we, found ways to encourage researchers to produce reviews, critical or not, of all outputs from the IGFs. One example, a critical synthesis of all chair summaries. But there are many other possibilities in that, that richness of material that we have uh, in all IGFs like seeking support for scholarships or funding for successful researchers to participate in the IGF and so, so, so on. Maybe the IGF SA could help in this, I don't know. But uh, is, is a way to stimulate more systematic elaboration on the contents, content that the IGFs produce. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Um, I took Paul's point to, to really mean that this wasn't about an IT issue. It's about what do we want to do with a website, whether it's tell a better story, i.e. marketing, or um, be more accessible for um, you know, academia or research or, or other issues. But that was a really good, um, a good addition, Carlos. Kenta, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Uh, my name is Kenta Motsuki, a Japanese MAG member for, uh, for the record. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, after listening you know, all the discussions here, uh, I just got back to the uh, with this personal outcome documents, and the paragraph 60, 63 uh, said that 
Uh, we extend for another 10 years the existing mandate of the Internet Governance Forum as set out in paragraphs 72 to 78 of the Tunisian agenda. So then, you know, I came back to the uh, Tunisian agenda, and uh, there, there are, you know, several mandates of us. And so, just in case, just a reminder, I, I, I didn't want to read, you know, everything here in order, you know, in order to, you know, let everyone understand what we, are, we have to do here now. So that, you know, air is discuss public policy issues related to key elements of internet governance in order to foster the sustainability, robustness, uh, security, stability, and development of the internet. B, facilitate discourse between bodies dealing with the different cross-cutting international public policies regarding the internet and discuss issues that do not fall within the scope of any ex existing body. And C um, is interface with appropriate intergovernmental organizations and other institutions or matters under their purview. D is facilitate the exchange of information and best practices. And in this regard, make full use of the expertise of the academic, scientific, and technical communities. And E, advise all stakeholders in proposing ways and means to accelerate availability and for affordability of the internet in the developing world. Uh, sorry for a little long, but I think you know we should you know recognize the importance of our mandates. So, uh, and uh, and also the. Um, uh, I think F, uh, strengthen and enhance the engagement of stakeholders in existing and or future internet governance mechanisms, particularly uh, those from developing countries. And G, identify emerging issues, bringing them to the attention of the relevant bodies and the general public, and where appropriate, make recommendations. H, uh, contribute to capacity building for internet governance in developing countries, drawing fully on local sources of knowledge and expertise. I, promote and assess on an ongoing basis the embodiment of WISIS principles in internet governance processes. J, discuss interior issues relating to critical internet resources. K, help to find solutions to the issues arising from the use and misuse of the internet or particular concerns to everybody users. And I, publish its proceedings. So when discussing the improvement of the IGF, um, we should always decode our mandates, you know, that I, you know, let, you know, now. Um, and also, the, you know, we have to think about which part of mandates we really want to, you know, uh, further achieve or, you know, improve. Otherwise, we won't be able to, you know, achieve our objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Kenta. I'm sure that was a good reminder for those that hadn't read the Tunis agenda um, recently. And there certainly is a lot of good advice and a lot of good, good um, direction there. The speaking queue is empty. So what I'd like to do is to close this. I think I'm going to suggest that we don't do the review of the program themes, that we wait and do that um, over the course of the next two days um, so that we make sure that we have time for um, items eight and items nine. Um, item 8 in particular, it's important that we get through today because Yuta's been driving that work. It's not really an appropriate discussion for the community discussion tomorrow, and she's not able to be with us on, on Thursday. So we need to get that in. And I think it's important that we actually have um, 9, the strategic discussion there, because that should actually form part of our report out to the community tomorrow. So if everybody was okay with that, we will um, capture item 7. Um, in our work um, tomorrow or more likely Thursday. Again, it was just meant to be a high level kind of refresh everybody's mind update anyway. Um, I want to thank everybody for going through the, the discussion here. Um, I said that in the Internet Engineering Task Force, they have a chair as well, and they'd always said the chair isn't the person who sits on top of these activities, it's the, it's the person that everybody else sits on, <laughs> it's the chair. So, I mean, I've just been trying to really pull ideas out and, and understand from the community where they think the priorities are, what is important, what should we be doing. And, of course, all that has to be tempered with what's possible for us to do. And, of course, we would always stay within the Tunis mandate as well. So um, I, I suspect a lot of those ideas will, will percolate amongst people here. We'll certainly get um, another run at this tomorrow in the open consultation day and then we can determine how we take this, this forward. Um, but I hope we don't lose kind of the, the um, enthusiasm um, for, for really making some of these changes. Um, you know, it's, we've always been about continual evolution. It's the time. Um, we still have a fairly long runway ahead of us on this mandate. I think the areas we've been asked to 
improve on are pretty clear. So I think the responsibility is just with us now to figure out what's appropriate and what can we execute on. Um, and I do hope we continue, continue moving this discussion, um, discussion forward. Um, so with that, I guess we'll turn the floor to Utah for um, item eight, which is the workshop process. And I think there were a couple of items there, not just the review of the evaluation tool. So Yuta, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Lynn, for giving me the floor. And um, probably I may ask Luis if he can, could you put up the uh, the tool so that everybody has in mind what we were talking about? Sure, I will do that. Um, I do think there are two things that we should take the time to discuss. First, uh, the experience uh, um, MAC members have gathered with working with the tool, trying to understand the descriptions uh, of the scores and trying to, to handle the tool. Uh, and we should take probably maybe 20 minutes or so for that. And then also, second point that we should discuss is uh, what constitutes a conflict of interest when you come to the tool. And you will see that when you start with uh, assessing a proposal, uh, the first question is, uh, I, you tick a box, I don't have any conflict of interest, and the second is I have a conflict of interest. So we will come to that later. First, uh, we would like to invite you uh, to share your experiences with using the tool uh, and setting the scores, understanding the definitions um, of the tool. And it's just up to the group to, to come in with your comments and those of you, those of you who have been working with it already. So we, we got some comments on the list, but probably it's better if you report your experiences uh, by yourself. <laughs> okay, but probably, Sylvia, would you like to explain a little bit why we came up with this uh, description <laughs> and why you also asked Luis not to show the, the values of the score, but the descriptions. I, I think you did a wonderful job on this. And <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jutta. Um, well, I guess all that information uh, was um, discussed on the calls, and I think I don't want to take too much of the face-to-face -face, uh, meeting on this. Um, the, the idea, I don't know if we can kind of do a show of hands to figure out how many of the MAC members here have actually had a chance to check the mock-up and try to score and see how it goes to see if you see anything weird. I guess the idea was to, to try to figure out if there is anything odd when you are trying to assess um, a proposal. Um, we can talk later about what will be like the best way to do it uh, once you have the actual test, test text of a proposal and how you put the information in. But the idea is to uh, work on our set of proposals, be very honest if we have any conflict of interest, as, as uh, Jutta just mentioned. Uh, the definition of what conflict of interest is, is in this space is kind of narrow also. So we will uh, come up with that little text. I don't think that has been finalized. And then all the six criteria have the same structure, absent, poor, needs improvement, good, and excellent. But the text for each one of what absent means or what needs improvement means for every criteria is different. So the idea is that when you are scoring a proposal, you actually take the time and read that criteria again. It might sound like uh, this is a tree or it's not a tree or whatever, but just <coughs> the fact that the, there is um, a description that captures what that a, a, that criteria, a tree for that criteria means, is important. So that's why the text is, is in your face, let's say. And then the idea is to have uh, weights for those um, criteria. I think we set for the third option on the weights, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we should refer to the text that is in our screen around how that criteria is defined and then what the number or the scoring for that criteria actually means to make sure that we are honest about sticking to how we understand that that assessment is, is done. So 
hopefully with that a three will be a three for everybody and not oh I thought I was thinking this and meaning that right so let's see how it goes is and and I, I I'm personally I'm really interested to see what the mark thinks about this once we finish all the evaluations um, to see how can this be improved um, in the future if you have any questions happy to clarify I think Meboshe, you have a comment. Yeah, never on the list. Never segue government uh, second term in May. Uh, I see no reason actually why we don't have a numerical value added in front of this as uh, we are going anyway to have a final mark uh, in uh, expressed in, in, in a numerical value, not uh, as a descriptive one. And uh, uh, I just don't know if. Uh, after uh, we finish one of the uh, workshop proposals evaluation, if we are going to get uh, uh, average value that we uh, assigned to this particular uh, proposal, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how, how this, uh, this, this functions. Uh, I, uh, can I, I answer that? Can I finish my oh, question? Sorry, yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. And uh, uh, I, I completely agree to, to have these uh, descriptions. They are really useful. But uh, for me, I would uh, add in front or after this uh, uh, description uh, numerical value that uh, it carries and also uh, the uh, direct calculation of the weight that uh, uh, such uh, that mark I given uh, carries into the total average. Sylvia, yeah, I suggest we take all the questions and answer it oh. then, because people might comment on the same. Then the next one would be Ben Wallace. Thanks, Jutta. Um, my comment had to do with the. Actually, that the screen's busy, so I won't ask you to scroll back up. But the initial, um, the first question, which is, I think, whether you have a conflict. Um, and so it's, it's human nature, and I think the Secretariat might confirm this, that the majority of evaluations will be done very close to the deadline. Um, despite best intentions, and that was the same with me, despite my best intentions last year. But uh, if, if I have any conflicts of interest, they need to be done by, the, that proposal needs to be given to another MAG member and I need to be given another one. So um, I think this point has already been made, maybe on the list, um, but it would certainly be helpful for the Secretariat to remind the MAG members when you send out the evaluations that would be helpful if the first thing they could do is go through all the proposals and identify where you might have a conflict of interest um, and and just put that through the system so that you can then go through and refarm them. Um, now, they're probably, yes, for me, I would have to click at the top, select a proposal. So I would select my subset and I would go through all of them and I would quickly know whether uh, or not, I had any conflict of interest, but that—that that was my main comment because that was the first question I got to, and um, yeah, that was all. I just generally, I want to say this is, I think, really uh, helpful progress of the workshop evaluation um, process, and I'm really grateful for the efforts that have been made um, to get us here. I look forward to seeing how it works. Thank you, Ben. Then Rudolf, you're the next. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jutta. I, I, I think it's, it's really very good and um, very intuitive, and you can, you can work with it. I have a, an additional question. If it is possible to have a tool um, that allows you during or but specifically uh, at the end um, of your assessment to have some kind of um, snapshot overview over what you have actually evaluated. Um, because from my last year's experience, at the, at the, at the, last, the last 10 or 20 um, workshop proposals, my head was spinning. 
<laughs> and I, I did not remember what, what was the first one I, I evaluated and at what score. And, I, and, and that is a little bit unfair towards, you know, the process. So if, if there is a possibility to have this kind of, OK, that's what you have done. That, that's the, um, like, I don't know, for policy um, track one, two, three. That these, are the, these are the fields or the workshop proposals that you have already treated, that these are the outstanding ones. So it would be easier to give justice, equal justice to all the proposals. I do think what Louis had already put on the screen is exactly what you're asking for. So you oh. yes, you get this table after you have completed. So then you will have a table of. It's, it's a new one. No, new one. No, no, it was the. Louis. Sorry, Daniela, for taking your mic. Uh, indeed, uh, it's not new one. It uh, existed already last year. So as does it pop up automatically, or do you have to? Yes. After you finish an evaluation, you come back to your table of finished evaluations, and you can order it by yes, any of the uh, okay. items, and you can edit your proposals at any time. So you can visualize everything as a snapshot and change your comments, change your any score, change any evaluation at all time until the deadline. So the only thing that has been added is a suggestion given by uh, Sylvia, which is to put these columns, like to visualize this same table in a way in which you have here, like the different scores and then the comments like in a paragraph style and then still you can uh, order by any of the, okay? So we can keep one or the other style or both. I mean, well, it's okay. Yeah, thank you, Luis, for your explanation and also for your great work. <laughs> I'm really impressed. Sylvia, would you mind to explain about the numerical values and the descriptions? Well, all of the all of our scores are stored in the database, right? So one of the things we did last year was that there was a spreadsheet circulated later where we had the, the, I don't remember if it was all the proposals or only the ones that made the, like the initial cut for the actual face-to-face -face meeting, but we can discuss on that. But there was, um, I think the value of the scores, personally, I think the value of having the details of, okay, this proposal is better on diversity, they have the same score, but this one is better on, the policy questions are better, or the diversity part is better. And then by the two scores, you might have to decide which of the two you will vote, let's say, to put them in the program, and the other one probably will not make it, right? But that will be useful when we have the scores of all the MARC members. So it might be possible. I asked last year uh, Luis to send me the spreadsheet for my proposals, and he was very kind to issue that spreadsheet for me. And I was able to look at all my numbers and all of that. I'm not sure how that might work for this year. If with the new system, we just copy and paste on a spreadsheet and we will work out. I have no idea, but that's something to discuss. But for when all the scores from all the MAC members are put together, then we will have to have the numeric values to be able to make those, you know, see those numbers and see how the scores fit better in two proposals that, or three proposals or four proposals that might have the same score. And that is important because if they all say poor, you don't, you, don't, you don't see the difference, let's say. So the number will become more important when we have all the scores, the compound of all the scores. Um, and I, I don't know, Luis, if you can um, issue like uh, spreadsheets for every MAG member later, or how do you think it might work? I, I have no idea how that uh, will actually pan out. But the numbers will be there on the on the back end of the platform, so we can always refer to that, and Luis has that information. So the, the, the spreadsheet that I sent that has the same uh, descriptions on uh, drop-down menus on, a, uh, on an Excel file for you to handle manually will just help you to see your, uh, you know, what, what you entered as an assessment, 
But as I said on the list, I didn't add the formula on that spreadsheet because I don't want to have an argument later that the, the formula that Luis has had one more uh, decimal and the one that I have has five decimals or whatever. So the, the owner, let's say, of the actual score is the secretariat. So there should not be any arguments about how that score is calculated. Uh, the spreadsheets are just a personal uh, way of refer to your own uh, information. But we will have all the numbers and all the everything on the on the database. If I, if I can just say, that's exactly what I said from the very beginning. Uh, uh, we are going to use numbers at uh, uh, later stages. So why not from the very beginning have them there? And if you, Luis, can pull to the table. It, yes, yes, yes. And here, instead, then in this table, instead of having uh, four as 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 a mark that we uh, have given to to this, maybe it would be better if we uh, already in this table calculate uh, the weight uh, that was assigned to particular uh, uh, criteria. That that was that was my suggestion. So this. Okay, this table, it's up to, to, to others, you know, to decide. You can see it, you can skin cat on different ways. But uh, I really saw, see no reason why from the very beginning we don't uh, see the, 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 the numerical value uh, along this uh, <coughs> description. I mean, it's at least for me, it's much easier when I see the number and uh, I don't see uh, that, uh, I, I, I presume there will be a no, not problem to somebody and it will not present obstacle if next to excellent uh, or before or after excellent somebody sees number five. So that's, that's my two, two of suggestions that I mentioned. Can we probably get some opinions from other MAG members as well who have been working with this? Because, of course, it should be as easy as possible for all MAG members to, to handle the tool and to do their assessment. Well, the whole discussion about having text descriptions was because last year a lot of the MAG members said that they didn't agree or they interpreted the numbers in a different way. So the whole thing about not having the number in your face on the first go is to make sure that you have the chance to read that text again and go and, and as, as score or assess assessed based on what that description actually means. So I uh, have no objection or, uh, you know, I have no issue with not having the numbers or the weights, all, everything from the first um, view, uh, but I guess this was responding to the comments from last year, so it's based on that input. And no, the, numbers, you, the, numbers, the numbers and the weights are included in the table anyway, and you can change them. No, no, so but just, uh, just to make sure, I'm not against description. I completely agree with description. I support description and thank you for making them. But just, I see really, can you tell me why is to somebody obstacle to see five next to excellent? Why is that the problem? For me, it's help. If somebody has explanation why it's a problem to somebody, I agree, okay, let's not have five. Can I try and help move this forward maybe? I mean, yes. I, I guess I don't understand. It's not an either or. I don't understand why we couldn't have a one in absent or um, if it's an aid to somebody and they're doing the report. We've all filled out many surveys where it's just ranked one through five. Um, and I think the text is incredibly important, but is there a strong objection to putting, putting the numbers in as well? Is that feasible, Lewis? I actually think the previous mock-up had them. Um, I think you had it in between parentheses, the numbers were included. So it's just, there is no reason. It was just responding to comments from before. So it, it seems we can do both, and if it makes it easier for, for people to work with it, so we have both descriptions and the numbers. Okay. But it's understood. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Rudolf, you're... St uh, 
Paul is looking for the floor back yeah, there. So I, I, I can't find my cue. <laughs> Please come in, Paul. <laughs> Sorry. My, my, my personal preference is not to have the numbers. Uh, I think this helps you think a little bit better of how you're scoring. But also, each of them are weighted. So having the numbers sort of suggests that they're equally weighted. Uh, by not having the numbers, it's more evaluated on, on how you rate it on, on the descriptive rather than the number. But it could go either way. Uh, but my personal preference would be not to have the numbers. Okay, now the discussion is open again. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I don't think it's uh, necessary to have a vote on this, but just make it easy for all the MAC members. And if we hear a lot of voices saying that it's easier to have the numbers, and of course it's necessary to read the descriptions because you, otherwise you can't go through, through this because the descriptions, as Sylvia said before, are different for each of the six criteria. So it's necessary to make yourself acquainted with the descriptions and to understand what it means to say absent for policy questions, that it's different if you say absent for, for uh, diversity, for example. Okay, the, so the suggestion is compromise, have them both, and I don't see anybody contradicting. So I would say this is concluded, and maybe we can take the last 20 minutes of this slot to talk about what constitutes a conflict of interest. We had also already put forward that question to the IGF MAC list and got some feedback. Uh, and that is uh, mainly, of course, if uh, the MAG member who was asked to assess the proposal is either a panelist, speaker, moderator, rapporteur, or organizer of the session, uh, this is obvious a conflict of interest. Uh, then there was several uh, discussion about uh, when the proposal comes from an organization or, or association that the MAG member is working for, then this should also constitute a conflict of interest. What is an open question is whether uh, about the affiliation of a MAG member to an organization that has submitted a proposal. So if the member is working for the organization, it, it seems to be clear that this constitutes a conflict of interest. But uh, there are different positions, uh, whether an affiliation to the organization or association sending in the proposal constitutes also a conflict of interest. Uh, so, and of course, this is related that to the situation that all MAC members are representing the community, uh, our stakeholders for the, uh, of the diverse stakeholder groups. So, of course, some of us will have uh, an aff affiliation to organizations that might submit proposals. And uh, therefore, I, I would like to ask your opinions again. What do you think? How, how close must a member of uh, the MAC be to an organization to say, I have a conflict of interest? Um, and in which cases could it be accepted to assess the proposal as well? And um, what Ben Wallace has said before, uh, please keep in mind that you should do this check whether you have a conflict of interest very quickly after receiving your, the set of the proposals that you should assess. Uh, so sometimes it, it might be the case that only when you go through the whole proposal and, and have have seen what is in it that you uh, uh, recognize that you have an affiliation to to the organization or to some of the of the uh, stakeholders that are uh, engaged with the proposal. So uh, are there any other suggestions what constitutes a conflict of interest or do you have any other ideas around that? I have a question. Yes. 
Yes, please. And then I'm do Yes, thank you. Um, so from the experience uh, from last year of the proposals, <clears throat> uh, when I'm making the evaluation, uh, I saw among the speakers my name, and that was a surprise to me because the organizer, yeah, they didn't reach out to me asking that I should be there or not. So in just such like cases, should that be considered as a conflict of interest? Because that was definitely uh, a surprise to me. If I understand right, Louis, that is already solved because all speakers need to be in the database, have a profile, and get an email sent once a proposal is submitted. So you, you would get uh, the information in advance, and then you, you could confirm, yes, I will be a speaker, or otherwise you say, no. I won't be a speaker, but I will be ready to assess a proposal. Okay. Uh, same. On one of your early questions, I think someone, well, I believe for someone to have, like, to declare a conflict of interest with regard to an organization, I think they must, I mean, if they work for that organization or have worked with that organization, that should, that's, that can, that should, or I would suggest to be considered as conflict of interest, or if they are receiving funding or have been funded by that organization, I would personally consider it as a conflict of interest. So this expands a little bit what we had said before. If you say, uh, if you had been working for that organization, so it could be an organization you have left five or ten years ago sending in a proposal, you would still think that is a conflict of interest? No. Yeah. Yes? No. Okay, some nod their heads, others shake them. Uh, Susan and then Mary. Um, Arsene, well, I, I appreciate your, your proposal. I'd have to disagree. I think that's a bit too expansive for the space where um, a lot of people have been engaged in this space for a long time and um, having a, a past um, past employment, even if it's five or ten years ago, disqualify you. Um, and that might be a bit too expansive, I, I think. Mary? Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, I want to support um, Susan. I think five or ten years is too expensive, but if within two years, I think you are too fresh. You are still very fresh in what happens <laughs> <laughs> in the organization. So that, that's my. But uh, it, it's a tricky one because um, uh, some of us in this room wear several caps. We belong to so many associations. Even if you are working in a government, one or two of the association might be part of your affiliation. You are not. You are not representing the affiliation here in uh, in the in the gag. But how far can we go to to clear the conflict of interest? Because um, um, the, there are multiple proposals from multiple chapters of an association. So how do we handle all that? So those are the tricky aspect of it. So I think we just to list the ones that we know that would directly affect the 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 evaluation of I mean the decision of the evaluator so uh, and see how we where we can draw the line because if we go along this line there's no end to it um i'm an ISOC, ISOC chapter member so if i see a proposal from any other chapter i should say there's a conf conflict of interest so those are things that we should uh, also put into consideration and have a, a, a cut off uh, point where to draw line on this conflict of interest thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I do think Arsene wants to answer directly, and then we have Louis and Michael Elisheba on the list. Well, I'm, I'm, not, sure, I'm not trying to answer uh, in anyone, but uh, just saying, if we go about, uh, you know, well, that was my thinking, you know, if, because I believe if you've, you've worked Whatever, how many years uh, you know you you worked for that organization, there's still kind of a link 
that may lead to a kind of bias in you assessing that particular that particular proposal because we cannot agree on uh, unless we go that way of saying well if you've been associated with it with it for more than five years or two years or whatever that can be a co very complicated exercise rather than just saying if you know you've worked or you are funded by or you've been I think that can be the easiest way because I think for for a 40 plus mag members there will be some people who have no association with uh, that particular organization and who can easily you know declare themselves having no conflict of interest with regard to the specific organization that that i think that would make our life much easier um well thank you louis Hi. just uh thank you Juta. a fast uh, piece of information uh, uh, to the maximum possible extent the proposals in the evaluation phase are presented um, anonymous. This means that only the speaker's information is, is, is available for the MAG members to evaluate. So the organization, the, the organizers, and it's not presented at this stage. It's only presented uh, the stakeholder group, the regional group, gender of the organizer, of the organizing group, etc., and the speaker information. But the organization, ex except if some information is written or you can extract it, it should be hidden to the maximum possible extent. But, but now I, I have a question back to you because uh, the diversity criterion is also based on, on the organizer and co-organizers, so people need to know whether diversity is addressed properly or not. You can see that. You can see that. What you cannot see, you, what you, exactly, you can see the gender, the stakeholder group, the regional group, the nationality, the everything. Oh, not the name. Not the oh, name, okay. not the organization. Okay, good. good. Exactly. Thank you. So, Excuse uh, me. Michael? Uh, uh, I just good want afternoon. a question for It's Michael first. Yeah, yeah good afternoon. Uh, this is the issue of Michael, government stakeholder group. Um, a third time at member. I've done evaluation process two times, so the one we embark on soon will be my third time. On the issues of conflict of interest, it's not something that is so serious as far as I'm concerned. Because at the end, at the end of the day, there are issues of integrity. If you can't evaluate a workshop based on the set goals, and probably your what your interest, because probably as as Asana said, that organization at some point might have funded you or you are doing works with them, then you mark them based on those emotional att attachments. I think that is wrong. Basically, last year, we had one of the best evaluation system. I think the system was, I think, led by Russia from Egypt. I don't know why we've moved away from it. That can easily be answered. It was uh, developed further. We did not step back from the system. It's mainly the same system. It's just more elaborate. Yeah, it's true. I've seen it. Like, I just didn't do the mock test because I think the time I was trying to do it, it was almost like closing up. I, was it? Is it still on? Yes, it okay. is. Okay, I think I'll try it this evening. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, let's uh, uphold some levels of integrity evaluate the sessions as they are we we move away from issues of conflicts of interest if i was to evaluate something from a zambian i will evaluate it the world evaluate a workshop session from somebody from germany it shouldn't be something that i should weigh maybe because i'm from this country let me give my citizens something with the attendance or we want to increase participation from africa because there's been so many workshops dropped from the global south no it shouldn't be like that thank you Okay, thank you. I, I have seen Mary raising her hand. Again. Oh, okay, sorry. I, I was to to ask, cl get clarification from Louise. The workshop proposal, you see the topic, the theme, and the order. When you take the, the, the main workshop, you are going to evaluate. You see the theme, you, you see the proposals or the organization. Normally, uh, ISOC, the, you will see, you know, mentioning ISOC Nigeria or ISOC uh, India or ISOC anywhere, right? So it is seen. The organization will be seen. 
if it's from ICC, ICC basis or ICC chapter of, uh, I think it, they, are, they accept we are saying when we are publishing that we are going to remove those ones and make it anonymous. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, um, last year when we were evaluating, we saw those names. And there are some names also that we are familiar with, we know, that are proposing a workshop. Um, those are things that might emotionally affect uh, uh, your, your, your scoring or somebody's scoring. So th 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 that's why we are, I, I want a clarification from you that those, those uh, information will not show the, 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 uh, at the workshop you are evaluating. Louis, please. Very fast. Uh, you see the organization from the, you see everything from the speakers as an um, evaluator, not evaluator, who are the speakers for the proposal quality, I guess. Uh, from, the from the organizers, you don't see uh, this data. So you don't see the organization, you don't see the name. You just see the diversity information. No, I, I mean the main proposal sent in by the proposer. You have to read through the proposal. In reading through the pro proposal, you see that it was from France, and is this organization from France? Those are, that are proposing the, the 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 workshop, I think they are there. I don't know how you will not see it when you are reading through the workshop proposal. Yes, the country is, is available, but only the country for geography information. Country, yes. Can I, can I come in on this um, just quickly? Um, I mean, so you might see some of that information through the, the, the workshop submission itself, but I, I think possibly only rarely. And the fact that we haven't disclosed the organization of the organizer or the organizer's name has actually been a process that's been in place for quite a number of years now. Um, and that was so that people actually evaluated the proposal on the proposal and the speakers that were there and not, you know, we're a global process and we're still a very small community and not on the basis of this was submitted by X individual or X organization. So that has been a standard operating practice for, I don't know, three, four, five years, maybe longer, but that's not a, a new change. Because the, 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 the evaluation should take place on the substance of the proposal and the policy questions and the speakers and diversity and the content and that sort of thing and not who may have led the process that actually put the submission in. So make sure we're all talking about the same, the same thing here. I, I do think we can wrap up the, the discussion at this point of time. And I do also think we have clearly stated what would be a conflict of interest. Uh, and uh, of course, it's all always uh, up to the responsibility of the individual MAC member to say, yes, I do have a conflict of interest or I don't have a conflict of interest. And if you feel unsure about that, if you get the feeling going through the proposal and say, oh, maybe that's uh, from an organization I've been working with two years ago, you, you still could go back to the secretariat and ask for clarification. So in, in the clear case that you say, I do see a conflict of interest, you tick the box. Uh, and then you will get another one. And as uh, Ben said before, this should be done as early as possible just to give time for, for other MAG members then to receive this new proposal and um, so that we have a transparent and fair uh, process. So I do think from the perspective of the working group, the questions that we had are clarified so far. Uh, is Susan and Sylvia, anything that we need to ask the MAG members right now? Um, no, certainly not on, on this topic. I think at some point we'll have to discuss how the um, proposals are meted out to the MAG members and the different groups, but we can, uh, and the evaluation process there. But I think for now we're doing well. Thank you so much, Yuta, for all of your work and guidance. Thank you. Uh, I do think we will have our next working group meeting before the next virtual MAC meeting, so we can put any further question then to the next virtual meeting. Thank you. Thank you to Utah and to the to the working group. I, I do have one question because I, I think it may be 
solved and if not we should recognize that it's still open um, last year um, individuals said I have interest or expertise in these topics these are workshops you can consider signing me up for um, and there was some um, concern about that and they people thought that um, you know, the, the purpose was to identify the expertise, so we had people that were knowledgeable about the topic actually evaluating the workshops. Um, but some people felt that that um, may be too close, that, um, you know, if you were particularly interested in Subject X and that was your organization's um, capability, then you might not be as unbiased in reviewing all the proposals and alternative opinions. And, and we had that discussion um, at the last MAG meeting or on one of the calls, and my impression there was that everybody was more, the, the, the kind of consensus view was that people were more comfortable with a random assignment across the MAG. Um, so, I mean, I, I thought we were like 85% close on that before, and if we're really that close, we can close it now and not tie up the working group or a future, a future meeting. Is there anybody objects to, and that allows the secretariat to get on with some of the other programming as well. Is there anybody that objects to a random assignment? The random assignment, by the way, still looks at all the diversity uh, qualification, the stakeholder group, the region, et cetera. Just to um, add. Uh, no or, so you to, you add and then we'll go to, to Ben and then Leanna. Oh. Just to add to this, uh, this is the best way to avoid conflict of interest. Once it, we allocate based on expertise, we would have much more cases of conflict of interest, so it's the best way to do it randomly. Ben. Thank you. I, I, I don't think, I don't have a strong opinion about whether it's allocated to, uh, to expertise or not, um, but I do think it's worth me, for example, just being assigned workshops for one particular theme. And each MAG member having a random assignment of workshops which fall under one particular theme. So the, the benefit of, of me evaluating okay. only workshops related to inclusion, for example, no. is that I start to uh, compare and get a sense um, of what's a you know, good proposal in this area, what's not. If it's completely random and I have a third of them on inclusion, you lose that ability to kind of gather a comparative um, sense of. No, that, that's a great point. And I took a shortcut in what I was explaining earlier because the other thing we did do last year was we did actually group workshops by tags, by themes, and then people were assigned to that theme. Um, and we intend to do the same thing this year. It's simply the people that are pulled into that group will be um, pulled in randomly, but that group will review a set of one or two tags, depending on how many tags actually actually come in. And that is so that we have the same group of people reviewing all the workshops on access or all the workshops on cybersecurity so that we actually make sure we're, you know, in our minds checking for redundancy, checking for completeness in terms of coverage of the topic. Um, and you've got a consistent evaluation base if you're evaluating everything in that tag. So I think that was a really significant improvement last year, which the MAG really appreciated, and that is still going forward. And I think we can offer one other functionality as well. If anybody really feels they've been offered a tag for which they have absolutely no knowledge, expertise, base, or something, um, I would suggest talk to the secretary, and the secretary can see if there's something we can, can do for that. I, th I think it would be extremely rare, but I'm trying to get beyond kind of any last <laughs> objections that somebody might have. I, I have, I have a, just a quick question. Are we going to, to uh, express our personal preferences to which categories we are going to, uh, to or you are going to assign as a category? Uh, no personal preferences. No, um, will be not like last year. Not like last year. That, that oh, is okay. the only difference from last year. No, well, I agree completely. Just wanted to, to know for yeah. my information. No. Okay. Thank yeah. you Thank for you. clarifying and making extra clear. Arsene, you have the floor. So just to make sure I heard it uh, right. So there is a possibility to reject like assessing a certain proposal if one finds they have like mm -hmm. close to zero knowledge about the proposal, right? That's a discussion you can have with the secretary, yes. I said I, I expect it will be very rare if you look at the three major themes we have and where we all are. But again, we were trying in to take an objection uh, away. 
Don't make uh, me sorry for saying that. <laughs> just, just in continuation to this, uh, last year I had uh, maybe one or two proposals that were in uh, French. Uh, which I'm not, no, uh, but that that falls in this yeah, in yeah, this category, true, yeah. you know. And uh, uh, last year we couldn't uh, change it, so I left it uh, uh, completely unmarked. That brings marks for for that that specific proposal completely down. If we could include such uh, uh, proposal also in this category, so to to, to request to be uh, pulled out from us, and if. It happens again. Who knows? Maybe it will be in German. Or... <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Yuda, thank you, and thank you to the working group who's done a tremendous amount of work here in a relatively short period of time to move forward um, a critical part of our process. And the tool just gets better every, every year. So thank you to the Secretary and Lewis, too, for all their superb work there. Um, I want to move to the last um, session here um, and not necessarily do a restart in the discussions from this morning because we had some of the, the discussions just by virtue of questions that were coming in, but ask, um, in this case, Daniela, um, if there's anything else she wants to say around kind of the current thinking around the high-level session, and then we'll ask the Secretariat if there's another introduction afterwards on the other Day Zero events or any more questions from the um, from the MAG. And then just um, some quick comments on the opening and closing ceremonies. There are some UN formalities we need to recognize, and I just want to make sure everybody's aware of those so it's not a surprise later. And then talk a little bit about what some of the, the, the thoughts are about those from, from yourself. And assuming we have time, um, begin advancing some of the discussions on main sessions. So, Danielle, you should treat this as, you know, your kind of, I wouldn't say starting over necessarily, but reflect what you want to, to the um, MAG on the basis of the thinking in, in um, the German government and the German stakeholder community and on the basis of the discussions we had this morning. But do what you think will make a sensible discussion. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Um, it's maybe coming back. Um, to the high level segment that we are planning for day zero. Um, our aim is a little bit to discuss really a vision for the internet uh, with the different stakeholder groups. And therefore one of my questions would be, what do we have uh, until now a submissions for day zero so as the side events? Because I think that would be given input also to our discussion in the high level segment seeing what others are suggesting for day zero. That would be interesting for us. Um, and, and maybe more or less an organizational question, <laughs> because uh, s some already addressed us uh, asking for invitations to come to Berlin. Um, and maybe it would be helpful if we could have a, an official undesal list of all the MAG members uh, to send that list to uh, all our uh, um, uh, embassies in, uh, around the world, because that would help maybe then, uh, or that would serve as a sort of an invitation, because what we ca cannot do is send out personalized invitation letters, right? But uh, I, I see the point, especially of all the MAG members, uh, to get a sort of an easy in, and that in our view would be the least bureaucratic way of doing this. So this would be a request to Andessa if you could have that such an, sorry? Yeah, it's, yeah, okay. Well, we had, a, I do not want to reopen a, a big discussion on visa we had last time, but in fact, I know that some, for some it would be easier to have such a letter, uh, but we cannot send out letters to everyone. And that's why we thought of having an unbureaucratic way of doing this, and this would be the list that we could then send around to all our, uh, embassies around the world, and then that would help you in, in, in getting the visa for, for coming to Berlin. Yes, um, for the visas, usually once a person is approved, they get a letter, an email letter, a computer-generated standard letter with the um, logo and everything, and that is used, uh, and they take that to the embassy for, uh, for their visa application. They still have to um, comply with all the other standard Schengen visa um, re requirements, but that proof of registration uh, should also help them get a visa. That's what we've done with most of them. Yes. Yeah, that, that is in that case, it is not sufficient because we will have the MAG meeting in June, and that will be before the official registration for the IGF. And uh, we have MAG members from outside of the EU or the Schengen uh, area who want to come to Berlin. And they need a visa already for this session. So it is not sufficient to have it for the IGF main session. We need it beforehand. Uh, okay, yes. Um, again, 
Yes, it's the same thing. I mean, a Schengen visa for Switzerland is the same. The visa for Switzerland is the same as the visa for Germany. Um, we usually send them letters from the IGF secretary. Yes, um, to get them their visa letters. Uh, most of the most of the letters that we've sent, especially for this time round, we've asked for multiple entry visas, and we've also listed that the MAG members will be coming to several meetings. So I think most people who got the letter got multiple entry visas, if I'm not mistaken. So it should cover. If there's a few people who you know may have been using the visa that they got f from January and it doesn't quite, we will deal with it. That's what we usually do. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other question for the day zero, we've got, I think, sorry, now I've forgotten the number. I think we have 13 at the moment um, applications for day zero, but it finishes off, uh, oh yes, on the 12th, so we usually get most of them on the last day. So, yep. Roughly, what would you expect? Oh. Last year's. What did we get last year? Um, Oh yes, we didn't get a day here last year. So. <laughs> 2017. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to count. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. We'll check. It, it, it doesn't take take long. Yeah. Yeah. I was asking uh, for two reasons because. Um, First of all, we, we told you last time that we have a lot of space, and that is the case. All of you who have been there know that already. But nevertheless, the space is not unlimited, meaning that we will then, in the end, will have to decide. Um, that's the first thing. And, and the second thing is that I, I just wondered if you can have a sort of a sense what kind of issues, what kind of sessions are already submitted, and if we can see something as a sort of a trend or something like that. That would be interesting. So I think to answer the first question, I mean, we've not had a venue that hasn't been space limited, so that's not that's not a, a problem or an issue, and and we can certainly work to understand the sort of space that is available, and um, and with respect to, as of, I'm not sure if we're extending the deadline from Friday to Sunday, but as of very early next week, you'll be able to see the open mm -hmm. forums um, requests that have been or day zero requests that have been submitted. So we would have that information for you then. Our scene. Yeah, sorry. Actually, uh, the, the the visa issue. Sorry, uh, sorry, I have to 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 bring this discussion back. But if there is anything you know that the host country can do, you know, to support the visa process, this will be really helpful. Uh, I'll, I'm thankful for the letter that I, I, I received from the secretariat for the f uh, January meeting, but it didn't, didn't work for me because I missed, you know, the, the the January meeting because I couldn't get my visa. And so I was supposed to, to like to request a, uh, a multiple entry visa, but it didn't work. So I didn't even get any single entry visa at that time. So luckily I'm here now, but who knows whether I'll be able to come back in June or, or in November. So any type of support, like any kind of special letter that the government of uh, Germany can produce at least to support MAG members, and this would should apply for the June and November meeting. This would be really helpful. Uh, I understand the invitation letter that is like automatically generated once one, one registered, but I don't think this one uh, really is enough. So if we can get anything uh, specific from the government uh, of the host country, this would be really, really helpful. Yeah, uh, that's actually very good feedback because we, we would like to know when it really doesn't work and then we can investigate the reasons why it doesn't work because it works for most people, but we don't know, maybe they were asking for some, I mean, we, I have no idea. I can't even um, guess what the reason was. But um, if you tell us, then we can investigate. And then next time around, uh, you know, we can see if we can solve the problem. Um, because, yes, I mean, embassies in different countries do um, are more stringent on the requirements, and some are less stringent on the requirements. So, yes, it's, it's, it's good for us to, to know this and get this feedback as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think Rudolph for bringing up the visa issue, <laughs> for everybody for for supporting it. It's obviously a, a, a key piece. 
Um, Daniel, can I come back to the, um, the high level session though? Um, so can you say a little bit more about either what sort of st structures are contemplating for the day and do you have any expectations of the <coughs> stakeholder communities that they should be working with their community sort of as we speak? Is it too early or is there no. something? No, in fact, we are already in contact with uh, the different communities and uh, uh, thanks again for those who are engaged and, and trying to help us to really get a high ranking participants because that's the idea. I mean, the idea is that uh, we get more relevance and visibility to the IGF and usually you get media coverage if you have the high ranking people there. That was the idea of, uh, first of all, saying, well, we will invite ministers, uh, and that's what we will do. Uh, and if you have ministers there, then probably uh, it will be interesting also for other stakeholder groups, not only governments, to come and talk to governments, right? That's the idea of basically uh, having such a meeting at day zero. We are not yet in the position to say how exactly the day will be structured, but the idea is to have sort of an opening session with a over an overarching theme, which in my view could be what is our vision of the of the internet? I mean, you can read a lot of articles about the different visions of, of the internet in the world right now, and maybe that could be an interesting topic. Maybe we will ha could have a sort of an, an introduction paper or an introduction keynote speaker, um, and, and then we'll have to split up because probably, hopefully, the groups will be too big to have a whole day long discussion altogether. But then we will have to split up, and, and that could be in the sense of different stakeholder groups, but maybe also, as we have now, the three themes, one opportunity could be to have then three different sessions mixed up the different groups to get uh, them into discussion among each other. I mean, to talk together, that's basically what the IGF has as a unique selling point. I was telling this this morning at, at, at business, that in our view, the fact that there are the different stakeholders are coming together and are exchanging their views and their different views and, and getting into interaction with each other, that's, that's basically what the IGF is all about. Um, and that's what we will try to do on day zero as well. And then they can come back maybe for over lunch uh, and have an, a new exchange of what they have taken away from their different discussions. That's basically more or less what, where we stand in, in, in our uh, preparation. And, and what we think, as we talked about uh, outcomes already today, um, maybe it could be a possibility to discuss also sort of an, an, an outcome. And we do not want to have a sort of a text discussion or something like that, and uh, ensure we do not want to have negotiations. Uh, but maybe there will be a sort of a then chair summary or something like that, that we could then uh, also post on our website um, as a sort of a takeaway out of the high ranking discussion of that day. That's more or less where we stand with our preparation so far. Ruf, do you want to add something? Could be interesting to think about asking those um, either that gathering, or if you do break into themes or something, um, what would be helpful for them to understand coming out of the IGF? What could the IGF help them with, or what could the IGF um, help them frame or understand or address? So almost more posing a question rather than um, kind of a summary. That would actually keep the dialogue and the engagement ongoing, ongoing um, which could yeah, be interesting. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that even feeds into the main sessions if we move the main, yeah. a main session to the end of the themes or something. And then um, get something out for, would, for yes. that day, right? Would have them coming back and understanding what the discussion was that took place during the IGF and how that actually added to, um, you know, whatever views or position or mm -hmm. discussions have been held before. Again, just still, <laughs> yep. still brainstorming. Yeah, as indeed the IGF should give, let's say, also advice. Maybe that's a very good idea then. Uh, having a discussion, coming out with questions, posing those questions to the IGF community, and then seeing what's coming out for parliamentarians at the last day, that could be an interesting story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
no, no, of course. No, just one thing. Um, there will be perhaps also an input by the high-level panel, just to flag it uh, for, for f on, on digital cooperation. If there, is a, if there is a report with recommendation, if the Secretary General takes it on and makes something out of it, it might be some input for, for the high-level discussion. But it is still not so clear what will be the outcome, but it might be one of the inputs. I mean, again, I, I think, you know, much of this discussion is, is trying to support some overarching goals um, the IGF has had, which is bring in more senior policymakers and more um, private sector participation, um, continue to be relevant and useful in terms of helping to address those issues that are kind of um, in front of much of the world today, what the Secretary General calls the more consequential issues, and um, continue kind of deepening engagement from a lot of those sectors through. So, and of course, focus on outputs too. So. Um, I really appreciate the, the German government and the stakeholder team behind you in terms of really trying to work with a lot of those sort of um, differing um, desires, if you will, to figure out what is best in terms of meeting, you know, some, some different demands. So, uh, again, I really appreciate the fact that we're still uh, kind of open and flexibly thinking about how to do this and accomplish those within, obviously, some expectations and discussions. Any other reflections or questions on high-level sessions? Susan? Thank you. Um, no questions at the moment for the day zero uh, high-level session, but just uh, returning back to the, the parliamentarian or legislator um, meeting, um, so I, I guess it's understood that this is still in discussion and um, we're still uh, having ideas about how that meeting would flow, but I would just like to say um, for the record that uh, we would hope that discussion be open, um, at least to all participants, um, that, that legislative session um, or parliamentarian session, just in keeping with um, the principles of the IGF. So I'm not sure if that was envisioned as a closed session or open to observers or who would participate. Um, but it, just from the discussion we're having very, very early on today about that parliamentarian session. Well, well I mean, more or less is also a little bit up to the parliamentarians who are designing the session, right? I will take that up to them, as I t uh, said this morning, but and, and I assume that they are interested in having a sort of a debate and an also an open part, but if this will be a completely open session, I can, can't tell you today because we are not inviting, right? Sorry, just to follow up. So would this be a, a main session or an open forum or a host country? Um, so if it's during the IGF, what type of uh, session is this being proposed as? That, that, that's, I mean, also this is still under discussion. It is so um, uncertain how this is going to get out. So we cannot tell you exactly what kind of session it will be. Perhaps it will be a main session because of the translation. Perhaps it will be an open forum. We will see. Um, it also depends on how many parliamentarians or legislators at the end will really show up. And um, it is uh, not so... I mean, when it's for the ministers, we are in a very good position. We, we know how to handle it and we have you know clear structures. With the legislators, they have their rights on their own in every constituency. So we um, have to be careful. We will take everything on board that we hear here. We will talk to them. And I think at the end, we will find something that is convenient for everybody. But now we cannot commit to anything. Thank you, Rudolf. Yeah. 
I really want to, you know, thank the German government for working with us on a, a lot of these because there are some guidelines um, where the host country has some um, flexibility. That's not quite the right word, but um, and the, the point of having something that entices the parliamentarians there was so that they participated in the IGF and were there for the IGF and for portions of the IGF. Um, all the stakeholder groups have their own stakeholder meetings. Governments have their meeting mornings. Private sector has their meetings. Civil society has their meetings. There, some of them are not on the IGF agenda. Their organizational meetings or their meetings where they want to themselves kind of grapple with a particular issue or try and understand it a little bit better. Um, I, I don't think if the parliamentarians want some meeting by themselves at some point during the agenda, I don't know why um, the MAG would actually argue with that as long as they were there participating in, in the IGF. We have a lot of activities that take place on day zero with GigaNet and a host of other things. So a lot of people come in for those day zero events and I think don't stay for the IGF either. Um, so it's sort of a community facility. So I, I don't think we're talking about a separate track in the IGF and we're not talking about closed meetings per se. Um, I think what we're trying to do is to figure out how we actually engage different sets of actors in the work of the IGF and find a way that make it work that makes it work for the IGF and what we're all about and provides value to them as well. So I didn't, it, it almost felt like the discussion was kind of an either or, like we're inviting parliamentarians and they're gonna go have a closed meeting over there. And that's, that's not what it is. But if they want some time amongst themselves to discuss the same way a lot of the other stakeholder communities do, I mean, I, I, I guess I wouldn't have an objection to that. And if there's an objection within the MAG or the community, I think we need to tease that apart a little bit because I'm, I'm really not sure why that's substantially different than a lot of individual company, um, government, or stakeholder organization meetings or meetings in the background. Any comments on that from, <laughs> from the MAG of the floor or from Secretariat? Arsene, you have the floor. Just for clarification, this is happening on the last day, right? The question is, is this happening on the last day? Yes, like the, the MPs meeting. It's on the last day, not, uh, not on day zero. Last day in the morning. Six o'clock or five o'clock, whatever you wish. And I, I think we need to understand um, sort of the scope of the meeting why it's helpful to them, why, frankly, they'd want to travel to Berlin at an IGF meeting to have a closed meeting themselves. Is it just because there's a convenient form or a venue? I mean, presumably, they really want to be there early and engage in the, in the IGF. Um, and I think we need to make sure that we actually facilitate that. That's why we're doing this. It wasn't because there's sort of, you know, a free conference room available at the back of the venue that they can go, go use. So, I mean, I want us all to figure out how we try and pull together these kind of competing, competing um, I don't know, values or objectives or something. Yes, I, I think at the end, I mean, the parliamentarians in most of the, or nearly all of the systems, they are used to debate in public. So I, 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 I think if we talk to them and if we explain to them that what is the, I, I don't think that there will be a problem, but we have to talk to them beforehand and then Let's take it from there. Uh, Tamea, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and hello, everyone. This is the first time I'm, I'm speaking today, so um, let me just take a moment for thanking everybody to, for being here and, and saying uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm sorry to have been out of these discussions. Uh, I, I'm splitting my time between the Oasis Forum and, and the IGF today. I um, just wanted to come in on a couple of points that, um, that we've been discussing throughout the day. Um, and thinking about having perhaps uh, a different exercise and talking, thinking about what kinds of sessions we are seeing at the IGF and for what purpose. Because I'm feeling a bit that um, in the IGF, we always try to think about any idea that comes our way, if it's fit for a main session or if it's fit for a workshop. It's usually these two that we try and, and, and fit 
things in it. And sometimes I feel like this conversation is trying to square down the the circle or, or circle down the square, trying to make, you know, um, to fit holes that it, are sometimes not necessarily fit for that purpose. So I'm thinking if, if we could have a, a discussion um, either now or on the mailing lists uh, on, on what kinds of other sessions, what kinds of other objectives we're trying to reach. Do we want to share uh, information about the IGF? Do we want to have capacity building sessions for newcomers or, or other stakeholders? Do we want to invite unusual stakeholder groups like the parliamentarians? And what types of sessions do we want? How much time in the agenda would we want to allocate there? And then what is left for the actual policy discussions and the main sessions and the uh, and, and the workshops and, and I try to think, I think from the other other side and, and in terms of inviting parliamentarians, I think that's a great idea. We could work with the interparliamentarian union. We can work with different governments that are represented here. Um, I think that's a stakeholder group that um, wasn't really approached before. I, I see no problem with with them being there. Just second Susan's um, call and, and what you said, Chair, for for having you know the openness. Um, for others to to participate and and and, and hear what this is be, what's being said and and take stock from from those conversations because I think that would be really valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Jamea. I think that's a, a good comment. And I mean, you actually brought to mind there's there's probably analogies with the newcomers orientation. We have you know special sessions that were directed to facilitate a newcomer coming in and understanding the IGF environment. Um, and another analogy that might be useful as we sort of think through this is within the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, wanted to engage with policymakers. And you can probably appreciate that it's not a natural environment for a policymaker to go to, particularly seven, eight years ago, Internet Engineering Task Force, where everybody's walking around in shorts and Birkenstock sandals. Um, um, and, and yet it was clear that the technologists needed to hear from policymakers and understand what their issues and concerns were. And policymakers had a lot of questions for the technologists. So um, there was a program that was run which um, actually reached out to um, some policymakers, asked them sort of what kind of interests or topics or questions or problems they were actually struggling with, um, got them to um, detail what they were. And then um, ISOC, in fact, working with the IETF leadership, drove a program where um, those policymakers came in had a few you know, newcomer sessions, orientation sessions to the work of the IETF and kind of protocols and rules and style and culture and, and that sort of thing. And then attended normal IETF sessions on their topics of interest. And at the same time, were, it was intertwined with um, more private sessions between the policymakers and technical experts so that the policymakers could say, and just, I really don't understand this. Can you just help me understand how X works? And there were people up at flip charts and whiteboards and drawing diagrams. And all of that facilitated an understanding and appreciation of both parties in terms of, of what you know, the, the particular topic was. Um, you know, if you looked at that, it didn't look like an IETF process either. And if you looked at it, it certainly didn't look like a normal kind of policymaker or government process. I don't know if the program is still running, but it ran for years and um, just had great reviews from policymakers and technologists alike. And it was really interesting. Technologists like to solve problems. So if they have somebody standing in front of them saying, I don't understand, or could we do, or would this work, or would, you know, they, they loved it. It was, it was really, really interesting to see those two together. But I think my point is that trying to understand what some of the objections are to Tamea's point. Um, if we're trying to get some new communities um, more deeply engaged in the work of the IGF because we think it benefits them and it benefits our work, then I think we need to figure out, you know, everybody's using purpose-built or fit-for-purpose sort of language these days. Um, you know, we may need to do some additional sessions, to not confuse it with our workshops, on, on the front end or back end that help them understand how to engage in this environment or to help frame an issue for them so that they can take it away or to help conclude at the end of the meeting what it is they heard and what some of those discussions are. So, I mean, I, I think if we, we step up to what are the issues we're trying to advance within the IGF, who do we need to be in the IGF to help us advance those issues, and how do we make this work for them and for us? Um, and as, and as Tamea said, rather than trying to slot them into, is this a workshop, you know, is it kind of an open session or a closed session? Or 
I think is is more to um, the task that we're actually um, uh, asked to do here as the MAG. So, I mean, I, I think that's what, um, I really think that's what Germany is trying to do with a lot of these sessions, and they're paying extreme amount of attention to the priorities and the strategic issues we've all said we want help with. And that was more senior policymakers, more private sector, um, trying to understand where there's value, and then, of course, we have the other requirements from the Secretary General about um, broadening the outreach, both in terms of developing countries in the South as well as particular types of practitioners, for lack of a better word. So we're trying to address some of those, those as well. Um, and again, in the, you know, the vein of, I think, trying to pilot some things and learn from them as we go forward. There's also another saying in the IETF, which is be liberal in what you accept and I think conservative and I don't know what you reject or say, something like that. I'm forgetting it at the moment. But um, I do hope we keep some of the higher level objectives that were, that were um, in mind. And none of us are trying to break the IGF. None of us are trying to work against things which are really counter to multi-stakeholder open consensus processes. But if we can facilitate some additional communities and some pr practitioners coming into the work, helping our work, and helping them when they go back to do their work, then I think that's a huge win-win. Um, I don't know if there's anything more at the moment on the high-level sessions. If not, I'll ask Chengatai quickly if there's anything he wants to say on the day zero, anything okay. that we haven't uh, covered just to date. That we've got 22 minutes left. I mean, as we covered a lot in the morning about. Just looking at we have 22 minutes left. Um, I think we covered most of it in the morning. Um, I won't repeat myself, but I'll just open up the floor to see if anybody's got questions about day zero. Um, basically, it's looser rules than what happens uh, during the week. Uh, it still has to be internet governance focused. And we want to have a fair mix of um, things that happen there, you know, in, anything from, you know, one full day like the um, GigaNet, yeah, GigaNet does, um, to, you know, 30-minute sessions. Uh, so it's, it's very loose. We just want something, you know, interesting, innovative, mixing, um, plain and blonde, whatever. But yes, <laughs> we encourage. Are there any further questions just now on day zero? Again, we'll have some visibility into those when the when the submission process closes. Benny? Uh, did I understand correctly that, uh, Daniel, that the German government is going to send the invitations for day zero, and you would expect to receive some list of respected uh, representatives of different communities. Was this something you said in the morning? You're talking about the high level, yeah. not the day zero, uh, sorry, right? The high I really want everybody to get that terminology yes. right. Yes. Oh. My mistake. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, what we will do is our minister will send invitations to the other ministers via our, our permanent uh, mission at the UN, right? That's, this is for the ministers' meeting. Uh, we are in contact with other stakeholder groups, but that, that's not decided yet. I mean, that will be also up to them. And the other thing I said just before, that was more, more to the MAG members. That's not a we cannot send personal invitations to all the IGF uh, participants. Right, but of course we will make sure that there will be no problem for MAG members, and the the less bureaucratic way was, in our view, to have that such a list. And then I learned today, while well, there's even a, an established process how that should work. And thanks to the Secretariat for that. Thank you. I'm going to ask Chengatai to just um, say a few words about kind of the, we'll, we'll go to the opening closing ceremony and come back to Germany in a moment, but just in terms of any UN protocol that we need to, to observe. Mary, go to Mary first. Sorry, Cheng. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the, the floor. I just wanted to ask whether the youth could be allowed to do their business on day zero. Yeah. 
I think the answer would be yes, but you know, youth and <laughs> doing business is. Um, I mean, they have IDF. They have the youth IDF, so they are coalition and the rest of them. I mean, uh, obviously, if there's um, been a submission for a youth event in day zero, that will be part of the, the evaluation. If there are other things that take place or we want to facilitate the youth getting together because there are different youth events taking place over the course of the IGF, then I think that's probably something the, the secretariat or the, the MAG could make available and, and facilitate. Um, I know one of the things uh, a lot of them say is that the most valuable thing for them is the connections they make when they're there. And if they can make those broad connections, um, I think that would be helpful. But we could probably find you know, a venue or a room, I would think. <coughs> Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you. So uh, we have the opening and closing ceremony. The opening and close, closing ceremony tra traditionally have been um, organized between the Secretariat, uh, the host country, and UNDESA. Uh, there are certain protocols, and we do adapt them uh, depending on the country that um, we are at. For the opening ceremony, the main purpose of the opening ceremony is for the passing of the chairmanship of the IGF, which is given to the Secretary General. So the Secretary General's representative passes on the chairmanship of the IGF to the um, host country chair, which is usually the highest representative um, there at the meeting. So if it's the, the, the chancellor, the chancellor comes in, and we have a little ceremony, and that is handed over to the um, chancellor. And then, when the chancellor leaves, uh, she can give it to whomever she uh, feels appro uh, appropriate. So that's the core of the opening ceremony, and, what, and the things that are surrounding the opening ceremony. It really depends on the protocol of the host country. Sometimes, in some countries, okay, the chancellor has to speak, but then, like in Mexico, the governor, the mayor, and a whole list of other people have to be there at the opening ceremony to speak, and we accommodate um, that. Um, <clears throat> And we, we, we also have, like in uh, 2017 in Switzerland, we had um, the ringing of the bell to, uh, for, the, for, for the opening of the um, IGF. In Bali and in Indonesia, we had a gong. Uh, and so it, it, it really depends on, on what's happening, uh, I mean, on the traditions of the um, host country. Apart from, uh, I'll jump quickly to the closing ceremony. So with the closing ceremony, um, it's not as formal as the opening ceremony, and it's usually maybe, I don't know, Minister of Foreign Affairs or whoever is available for the closing of, this, uh, of the meeting. Um, we have the host country representative. We have a representative from um, the UN, um, the highest official who's there um, at the UN. And then we also have representatives from the stakeholder groups, uh, usually uh, what happens is that we ask each stakeholder group from the MAG to nominate a speaker to speak at the closing ceremony, and then they can ha give their reflections on um, how the meeting has gone, gone the last couple of days. Um, <clears throat> and there may be also additional speakers, depending on um, the host country's wishes. Uh, so those are the two ends. And then we have the opening session. Uh, which is um, different, and this is something that we've also grappled with because um, at the very beginning it was just a conveyor belt of speeches, and we've tried to liven it up a little bit, but then if we are inviting uh, ministers and high-level representatives, uh, they really must have um, a part in, in the opening. and. Um, the last two times it has been a panel. Uh, this year we are trying to take on board what the Secretary General has said and maybe try and invite some of these people who not normally come to the IGF. But we also have to make space for the ministers that come. So that's something that we have to discuss um, amongst us and how we're actually going to do that. Sorry, Sylvia. And don't forget the photo with Angela Merkel. 
<laughs> I'm not leaving Germany without it. <laughs> <laughs> So we, um, mm. well, thank you, Tanya. I mean, this is very helpful. So the, the, mm. the formal ceremonies he talked about at the beginning are probably roughly a half hour and an hour at the end of the, of the program. Um, and again, this is another terminology thing because we spend far too much in past years and Mag's getting confused over kind of the ceremonies versus sessions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but there, are, there is some protocol we need to, to follow. And then, of course, the territory actually gets turned back to <laughs> Germany at the end of the at the end of the IGF. Um, but the opening sessions, I mean, that is something we're going to need to spend some time thinking through. The last two years, as, as Cheng and I said, we have gone to these um, smaller sort of VIP panels where we had, um, we tried to have, rather than the, as he said, a conveyor belt of speeches, we tried to have themes um, with a few VIP speakers speak to those themes and then actually take questions from the audience. A lot of those People in, in, the, in the audience were plants because there were other VIPs that um, really did expect and would normally be given a speech at a, at a UN session. Um, so we're trying to find a way to, to accommodate the expectations of a whole host of different stakeholders in a format um, that works within the IGF with all of its um, expectations in a way that actually delivers an interesting discussion and value to the participants. Um, and that's a big enough task in and of itself. If we're actually really successful at getting top-level CEOs and top-level policymakers in, the task becomes even more Herculean. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I sort of share that now because it is something we need to start to, to yeah, think through and work towards, yeah. and it is for the host country. But the host country, I know, um, just as every other host country has, wants it to work for the IGF within the expectations of the, the community as well. So while there is a responsibility, which is the host country, um, it clearly needs to work within the context of the IGF and the, um, and the community as well. So that's why there's always been, um, been this, this kind of exchange. Please, Daniela. <laughs> So we know that this is probably the most difficult task, all the difficult tasks we have for the IGF this year. I mean, the more successful we will be in, in getting high-level people to the IGF, the harder it will be then for the open ceremony. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, we expect uh, that um, the UN Secretary General will be there to hand over together with the Chancellor. Uh, and then we, we know that our minister will be there. He has his session already on day zero, so that will be fine for him. Um, but our ambition is also not only to have high-ranking government officials for the, the opening ceremony and, and session, right? But, uh, but really to, to keep the people that are coming for day zero for that high-ranking discussion to stay, of course, for the IGF and be there the next morning um, to yeah, to transfer that into the IGF and to have that as a discussion for the panel and and in my view, of course, we will have to to give speaking time to those people, but in in my opinion, it's not the best way to have speech after speech. But what we will at least try to do after, of course, the speech of the chancellor, um, to, to have more of an interactive session. And we sh should be in close contact about that uh, afterwards. Uh, there, there's one issue I would like to raise here today as well, and that's the question of, of the open mic at the end, at the closing session. Um, we wondered a little bit if the three-hour open mic session isn't, uh, couldn't be a little bit long. Um, and, and maybe after the ceremony part, what about having the first open mic session as a sort of an introduction to the uh, IGF, uh, and so to, so to say, split the three hours to one and a half hour at the beginning and one and a half hour at the end. In, in, in our opinion, that could be more lively to follow uh, instead of having a, a three-hour session at the end. Thanks. We'll, we'll come to the, the queue in just one moment. I mean, the, um, 
open mic session was sort of extended last year. Um, in past years, of course, that three-hour slot is actually part of the closing ceremony as well. Um, and it was, I think, um, a conscious decision because we'd had the Secretary General there and his comments, and we'd had President Macron's speech and his various calls and comments. We actually thought there might be an opportunity for good dialogue across the community on those two, so it was relatively open. They've been less open in past years, and we've actually had a structured time, which said we'd really like to hear from the community back on um, this, you know, more strategic area. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to take a half hour and hear back from the community on this, so we can structure it um, differently as well, and and keep in mind the request, which said maybe there's an opportunity to hear from the community at the front end of the meeting and at the at the back end of the the meeting. Um, we have Kenta in the queue. Kenta, you have the floor. And in terms of the time, let's close the queue if we can after um, Ben, so we make sure we keep the, the transcribers and the AV support and that sort of thing close to time. And then we can pick all this up tomorrow. So Kenta, you have the floor. OK, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Um, uh, I'm Kenta Mochiki, Japanese Business Bank member. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, as far as I remember, uh, in the last year, many people couldn't participate in the opening and closing session. So uh, this year, you know, I hope uh, there will be you know, more transparency, you know, for the you know various stakeholders from all over the world. So, um, like you know, IJF Geneva 2017. Thank you. Um, Kent, I'm not sure. Are you saying that? people had VIP speakers that they wanted to participate in the sessions and there wasn't room for them, or is it something else? Yes, that's right. Uh, oh. It's work? Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, actually, you know, I, I, I know many you know, Japanese stakeholders who couldn't participate in opening and closing session somehow. I don't know why, but uh, actually, you know, we, are, we were in the, you know, different room uh, to, you know, watch the, you know, some, you know, screening. So, uh, uh, I think you're talking mm. about um, the room was filled and then we had to go to an overflow uh, room. Just filled? Yes, it uh -huh. was just full, yes. That's no security control or something like no, that? No, 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 ah, it was just that there weren't that's enough why, seats uh, in the room. In that uh, case, that's good, that's good. This year, mm. there will be enough seats, ah. yes. <laughs> so maybe we need more space. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you, appreciate it, thank you. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Hannah, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to be brief, I thought it might be interesting to link uh, the the point on on giving giving VIPs a role, VIPs from different sectors a role, um, with our previous conversation uh, on outputs outcomes. So, would there be and j again, just brainstorming, thinking out of the box, um, would there be would it be an option to perhaps give VIPs from two different sectors uh, leadership in coming out with common messages and threads uh, from one of the tracks, for example? So we say, um, OK, you can only speak for two minutes in the opening in an interactive format and not a speech, but you would co-lead um, messaging on privacy, for example, or recommendations on uh, security or something more more specific than that, um, and even if we just had three, then you'd have roles for six VIPs um, that either would have a shortened uh, role in the opening, uh, or wouldn't have a role in the opening, but would have some something to do there. Um, and the reason for suggesting it is, I mean, th this happens in in a lot of UN fora. Um, and I think it is it is helpful to look at look at other things, particularly from from stakeholders that are looking for outcomes, um, perhaps to engage them in, in creating those or finding some of the common threads uh, in different sessions. Um, and just to recap, uh, what what's meant by common threads? It's um, that oftentimes you have multiple side events on similar topics, um, and and yes, that's very well captured at the macro level uh, in a chair summary. But perhaps something more along the lines of, of recommendations on um, you know, furthering, uh, furthering these topics for the purpose of harnessing tech for development, for example, uh, would be helpful. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Lots to, lots to think about. Um, we do need to update the Q2 because Hannah is, in fact, a MAG member, but it doesn't, you haven't been designated as that when you've taken over. We know it, um, but so that everybody yeah, participating it's, online it's knows it as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, June, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and hello, everyone. This is my first time, my first 
um, on the mic. Uh, first of all, I want to say that the IGF seems to be getting better and better, thanks to Germany, from what I've seen so far. Um, secondly, I'm happy to see that the VIPs are being included and given a role. And also, I want to go back to what the co-chair said earlier about um, the open mic, um, cutting it in half. Um, one and a half hours at the beginning, one and a half hours at the end. I think that's a really good idea. And that's my part for today. Yes, thank you, June. Ben, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I could support shorter um, opening plenary sessions. The, 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 um, the idea they wanted to put forward was I wasn't able to be there last year, so I don't know how it worked last year, but in Geneva in 2017, uh, I think the Swiss had a professional journalist moderate the session. So in response to Daniela's concern about you know, we don't want to just have a bunch of um, speakers going down a panel, um, that the way the Swiss managed it was quite good because it was a conversation, it was asking questions, um, it, it was a more valuable session as a result. Th thank you, Ben. Uh, we have two minutes left. I think we've done um, A and B. I think on the main sessions, um, I think that's quite an extensive topic, and I think we will move that forward. We have touched upon various things we might do with the main sessions, both in terms of um, how they might be purposed, either at the beginning of the introduction of a theme to help set it up, or um, at the end to help pull threads together from the various workshops and the themes. We've um, talked about where they might be placed physically in the program as well. So I think there's a lot of ideas um, floating around. I think we should keep um, that discussion open. Um, and I think we should start to drill down in terms of what some of the objectives are of the main sessions. Um, and we do still need to have a discussion because not all the the main sessions um, specifically come for or driven by the MAG. In fact, in past years, we've had um, you know, a practice of um, having some uh, dynamic coalition presentations as a part of a main session or a main session or national regional um, uh, IG, youth IGF initiatives also. So I think we need to think about what are the things that's appropriate for um, the main sessions and, and um, I don't know how much we'll be able to do with respect to the topics until we've actually seen the workshop submission close, but I think we can have a, a kind of a general discussion on some principles or some options probably on the on the Thursday, the third day of our meeting given tomorrow is the, the open community. So we will not lose that topic. It is obviously critically important and one of the um, main MAG responsibilities. Um, I just think we're out of time today, and um, we do have some more time to advance that. So let me see if there are any final comments from Secretariat, Andessa, or Daniela before we close. No, maybe. I mean, uh, from from day one, I just want to uh, say that we, I, I take note of the main issues that are raised. I mean, it was clear that we need a marketing communication expert, and I will raise that not only website, but but for other outreach channels. Uh, one thing that I'm taking is also we are organizing a side event together with Germany, and we will be sharing chair summary uh, to all ambassadors uh, in New York uh, with an invitation letter. Uh, and also for the IGF invitation, uh, we will be posting soon uh, generic invitation letter from our Under Secretary General on the IGF website. We also don't send spe uh, specific invitation letters to people. Um, um, whatever presentation you're pulling together to reach out to missions or whatever, it could be interesting to ensure that the MAG has that as well and the NRIs and so that people can actually use some of that context um, to um, outreach within their own communities and their own engagement, convincing them to come participate in the IGF. Um, so if there's some materials um, that we think would be, could be repurposed and are useful, just, just keep that in mind. 
Um, we have obviously national, regional, and youth IGF initiatives that are meeting, and if a piece of that was um, promoting the IGF meeting in Berlin, which I know they do, but if they can do it with some um, other materials that are being um, pulled together, I think that would be helpful as well. Um, the um, what did I want to say? So for tomorrow, um, we will um, just have a very um, kind of light set of opening statements in terms of the introduction. It's the open consultation day. Um, Eleonora is working on capturing the discussion here that she has just sent, but I haven't read it yet. I've seen. Um, and she and Shangatai and I can take a look at this and Daniela if you're um, interested in terms of um, just setting up the discussion with the community tomorrow and looking for community um, comments on what they see as the strategic priorities and then any ideas they have on how we might actually um, advance them. Um, and then in the afternoon, there's an item which is called the workshop process review. That's where we ask the community for their um, um, input on the workshop submission process that they've just gone through. Um, any questions they have, but also um, really understand how well it worked for them if there are some other areas that need additional focus. We have a presentation on the NRIs later and um, some information to be shared on IGF intersessional activities. As we report out on those intersessional activities, um, again, we want to be pretty brief in those comments because we want to actually hear from the community with respect to um, their um, um, comments or questions, um, suggestions for improvements on all those areas as well. This really is about hearing from the community. Um, so our interventions ought to be setting up the discussion, if you will, um, or, or kicking off the discussion, but, but really inviting um, comments from all of them. And then at the end of the day tomorrow, we have um, our traditional um, strategic contributions from related or relevant um, internet, internet governance organizations. And that tends to be a group of people that have um, come in. But actually, I'm, half of that will actually be the HLPDC report. So yeah, maybe we'll figure out how to move that forward to make sure we've got enough time for for everything, but that's the um, agenda as it sits now. I want to thank everybody um, for staying with the day. Um, and there is a WISIS reception, which everybody is invited to, which I think starts at 6.30 in the, the cafeteria, right? Is it a CICG? CICG. Yeah. Oh, that's right, that's right. It's in the CICG building. Um, Everybody knows where the CICG building is. You can either go out the Montreal exit and look right and walk down the end of the street, or I think there is a little secret, secret side passageway if it's still open. So if there are no more questions or no, reception starts at 6.30. Um, hope to see everybody there. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.